Good afternoon, good evening, good night to you, Maximus. Good afternoon, evening, night uh, to you. You're getting Mr. just like your, uh, the great. You're getting just like Mr. JQ. You're late, and uh, we're starting 12 minutes late today. So, all your fault. Okay. Yeah, uh, I have to admit there was a little schedule mishap, as they call it. Uh, hopefully your girlfriend isn't going to sequester you like she did the last podcast at three hours or two and a half hours. So guys, I gotta <laughs> yeah. go. See you later. Talk about RC later. I'm going with my girlfriend. Yeah, we had a thing planned. So I was thinking like, okay, I'm gonna reserve like three hours for the podcast. JQ is obviously late, didn't account for that. And then JQ went on for an hour and a half about lap time. So I mean it was good, but you you yeah. notice how everything Whenever he comes on a podcast and he has that time to talk about something, everything is the only thing that's important for him to talk about is what he has to talk about at that time. Yeah, everything he's just else, waiting for <laughs> everything else is like hurry up. Nobody was here about that. Blah blah blah. Yeah. And that's when we got, you know, we had to we had to put him in his place. But you know, we'll talk about that and more. Let's drop the intro. Let's get cracking. We are gonna try and stick to a timeline today. Mm hmm Yes, we are. Is the glory, but e buggy pays the bills. Welcome to the No Name RC Podcast. Get ready for some serious bench racing, but be warned we speak our minds, express our thoughts, and sometimes things can get a little rowdy. Hate, and he just was influenced by the hate coming from the left, the hate coming from the right. And let's get back to more club racing and less of this. Hard to be arrogant when you're always right. Yeah. See what I mean? That's exactly why people call you arrogant, Max. You may not agree with everything we say, but it's definitely worth a listen. And our pick, can you stop whatever you're doing? Join your host, Lefty the Great, with co hosts and guests as they get together <laughs> to chat our city. Hey, after that race that I watched this morning, I have to talk about it. Hundred bucks right here, hundred dollar throw. Oh no! <laughs> I like this. Yes, 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 indeed. Nitro is the glory, but e buggy pays the bills. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode number. 293 of the No Name RC Podcast. I'm your host, Keenan White, a.k.a. Left of the Great. And over to my left, virtually, is the one, the only, Maximus Mortimus. Piss her off of nations. Piss her off of countries. All countries. I'm, ju I'm just a common roach, dude. <laughs> exactly. Just a common roach. All right, Maxwell, welcome back. Uh, we are just getting together on the show 293 to talk RC news. Do a little double dabble and wicked weekend. Look at some NNRC cop results. Look at some. What else do we have here? You have a whole bunch of stuff here that we have to go through, mostly dealing with news and stuff like that. Uh, and we have some questions this week. So this weekend, there's no guest. There will be a guest next weekend. If I'll be putting out a podcast. Be a special guest. He might win the world championship in uh, September. So you have to wait and see. But welcome back, Max. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for the continued support. Big shout-out to the NNRC squad around the world. We can't do it without you guys. Thank you for all the continued support. If you are listening to this on the audio-only platform, please come over to YouTube, hit that like, sub, and notif notification button. Go back over there, leave a review. If you haven't hit that like, sub, and notification button on our YouTube channel, please go there. Uh, and also follow us on the rest of our social media platforms as well. Also, a big shout-out to the patrons of the NNRC and the YouTube members. You guys go to Extra Mile. You get extra uh, you get early access to this podcast. If you wish to support us a little bit financially, every little bit helps. Uh, links for that in the written description of this podcast. Also, a big shout out to our sponsors of the podcast. Remember, showing the sponsors some love, shows the podcast some love. We have links for all of their uh, products and uh, websites. We have some affiliate links. We have some coupon codes. If none of that's there, just say, hey, I heard about you on the No Name RC podcast. They are Invisible Speed. We're recording this Wednesday. I know they have a session with Ryan Lutz tomorrow, which will be Thursday. 
High Tech RC, Corsa Tech USA, Sidewinder Fuel, Mayaka Beach RC, Techno RC, Clinic RC, Stacked RC, Racecraft USA, Elite RC Productions, uh, Call RC, and Donathan RC. A big shout out to them. A big shout out to our drivers, Dave Ronafog, Robert Batty, uh, Alexander Hagberg, Maddie G, Pecco, Ivan, Una Hotnin, and Mason Fuller. And uh, a big shout out to all of our affiliates. We have links for that in the written description of this podcast as well. Max, real quick, I'm going to run the, through this real quick because we have some birthdays. Happy birthday to my wife. It's her birthday today. Happy birthday to her. Nicholas Uribe, Don and Bolivia. Happy birthday to him. Mike Boret. Uh, Ezra Arantando, son of Philip Arantando. David Talent. Happy birthday to him. Uh, Ryan Follow, RC. My good boy, my buddy Joba, who was her, helped me with my, my cars yesterday. My boat, sorry. Chris Nunez, happy birthday. Ryan LaCoyer, Trevor Moran, Ethan Lafrabe. Oh, I butchered that. Lafrabe? Lafrabe? Someone's at the It's probably not. I don't know. Aaron Boren, Buran, Tony Maroney, Brian Parker, Javier Barrios, Gaston Latrick, that's our friend from Chile, Nick Hartman, Scott Chilson, Sasha Tuber. Damon Smith, Ricardo Fosh, Mr. S. Works himself. Happy birthday, Feliz Companions. Billy Easton, Luke Bennett, Steve Cohen. There's quite a lot. Brad, Brad Man Maynard, Maynard, Curtis Oliver, Warren Campbell. Happy birthday to all you guys. If I missed your birthday, I greatly, I, I do apologize about that. Uh, but happy birthday if you're celebrating a birthday over the next week. Uh, a big shout out to the friends of our show. We have the Dirty Assets Engine Services, Tony Patashaw and Joseph Patashaw. Check them out on Facebook. We have links for that. I see my good friend Lorenzo who's battling some health issues with his, uh, he's got Crohn's disease. So he's making a, a movie. Go over to his channel, Fast Movers RC. Hit that like, sub, and notification button. He showed me some of the movie that he's going to make, and he has some plans. And a big shout out to RCRC Podcast Tiny of Truth Mothers with Tiny Folsom. Him and I become good friends over the last year, and then he's like really into RC. He's got a shop. He sponsored the, uh, sponsored our content, going to, to the worlds and all, all that good stuff. So a big shout out to them. I saw they were live yesterday, as well as uh, uh, Joe Zaire and my good friend Zach Donathan are doing their podcast as well, Ran Out of Talent. And uh, a big shout out to all the podcasters. Also, a big shout out, Max. So this happened over the live stream for Wicked Weekend. You know, I'm a big, I love coffee. And uh, I was very thankful of people bringing me coffee. So I went, people would, I would like, hey, you know, I need a coffee. If you're out traveling, I would like a Dunkin' Donuts or, or a latte or a Starbucks with latte with oat milk and I and I would get one. Somebody would be out maybe watching the race. Go make a food run. Oh, let me get a uh something for lefty. Uh but I appreciate that and you know coffee was talking about it and then uh Frank Sell from Hermit Hustle and get shit done coffee. So if you like coffee, I'm going to send you some. So he sent me a little cure package. I got 12 of these. I got a hat. I got some some uh, this is cold brew. I don't know. You're a vegan. I don't know. Can you drink coffee or is the go against? <laughs> what what animals are in coffee? No, I mean, I don't oh, they they drink coffee, coffee, coffee that the animal eats the seeds and then poops it back out or some sort of that. Oh, yeah, that's the cat. Like, there's a specific cat species that yeah. eats the coffee beans, the specific beans, but that's like really expensive. I don't, I think it's like what I've heard, it's really bad too. But, but get yeah, shit you, done. You do coffee. know. You do know that Finnish people drink the most coffee in the world. No, they don't. That's a fact. Yes, that they do. It's actually, I think. That is a let, let me Let me you get You don't it. have enough people to drink the most coffee in the world. I mean, per capita, obviously. I, you cannot drink more coffee than Dominicans. They drink coffee out Portuguese. Put, nobody drinks more coffee than Portuguese people. Then guys uh, drink coffee to go sleep. Okay, okay. L listen to this. Uh, Finnish consume more coffee per capita than people of any other nation, getting through 12 kilograms or 26.45 pounds a person each year. Mm, all I know is that that's good. All right. But thank you, Frank. Sell get shit done coffee. Maybe you can sell some to fill in as they consume more coffee than anybody per capita in the world. Apparently. Uh, but yeah, maybe you can. That, that's because that's because we only consume like ground coffee, mm -hmm. so I think that kind of adds to it. And also, like we have a government or law mandated coffee breaks. It's in the law. It's coffee break. Right, right. And so that's how long like twice. 
that's like 15 minutes but that's like you know work day every work place must have coffee breaks right so. right i get that well i appreciate you sending that frank home and i was talking to him earlier this week i love his, his his the way he talks and his attitude is very inspirational nice dude he races rc and he sells coffee and he has, he has a whole lot of stuff going on so thank you i appreciate it if you guys want to try out some of that coffee i'll leave links for that in the written description of this podcast also i want to say it's a big uh, this is awesome so obviously, you know, I'm very well tuned in with the Southeast because I, I go there a lot. There's three racers that are going from the Southeast. There's David Olsen, HB racer, Ryan Daze is actually a racer, and Josh Hollyfield. They're going to the Worlds. So a few, few tracks around the area had some fundraising events for them. Loganville had an event for Josh Hollyfield and Ryan Daze. SMB had an event as well. And Sumter's having one this weekend. It's good to see these guys getting around, helping support their racers going to the Worlds. I, I, I've been talking to these guys. They're super excited about going to the worlds, and that's good because this is what the world should be. If you're not on that pro level, right, where you're going to go win this and probably be in the A final and try to make money, it should be an event where you go to enjoy the atmosphere and just enjoy it. Where you finish is where you finish. You know, yes, you want to do well, but you want you want to finish where you want to finish. All right, Max, that's all I have at this moment. We're going to get right into some uh, paying some bills with Invisible Speed. And we're going to do that with talking to Mr. Lutz. Are you implying? Are you applying any of the invisible speed? Absolutely. I, at LCRC last weekend, I spent like five hours just sitting there reading this thing. It was amazing. And I'm starting to think of setup differently, and I feel like maybe I'll be able to help people eventually. Yeah, I think uh, I, I really like the pairing between you and Joseph. Many people are shocked by that pairing, but I'm not. Uh, I think you're doing a good job, and I hope that they, I, I fully believe in visible speed, and I think with somebody like you behind it, you can do well. Yeah. The Kyoshas are looking good. I mean, Kyosha is growing every time I see it coming through these races. Yeah. I attribute that to you, especially over here in the USA. I'm Appreciate sure Europe, that. they have a lot. But uh, good job, man, and it's good to see you. What I always say, it's good to see you in RC. It's good to see you doing well, and good to see you having fun. Appreciate that, Keenan. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Let's go talk. All right, good. Always good to see Lutz. I like Lutz a lot. I see he's getting a lot more gray hair. I have a gray beard. He has gray hair on his head. But uh, still, he, I mean, isn't he quite old already? Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, he's close to forty. Yeah. He's thirty nine. So maybe he's in his fortieth year. Maybe he's not. I don't know. But I I like Lutz. Remember when at that time he was contemplating when the RC there be might be RC without Lutz. Ooh, man. Yeah. That God, was. Beating, uh, we, Thank God we don't have to worry about that. I'm glad he's back and doing very well with Kyosho. But yeah, Invisible Speed, if you want to, uh, as this podcast comes out, Ryan Lutz would have been on the Invisible Speed Discord doing a message. Uh, he's also not only just talking about Invisible Speed, he's also talking about his Kyosho and all that stuff. So uh, if you want to learn more about Invisible Speed, we have links for all of that in the written description of the podcast. Get in, get informed, and make your speed visible. All right. So quick catch up, Max. The only thing you have in here is JQ has gotten enlightened. Yeah, I, I watched his um, <laughs> recent I I lives watched when I was training. Yeah, but I, I mean, looking at his lives, I, because I've been wrenching this week, and the, like he's all you know enlightened these days. He, I don't know what happened to him really. I haven't seen him much because he doesn't race himself anymore and so on. So I haven't seen him much this year. But he's like, uh, it seems like he found God. But it's not God, it's just like common sense, you know, like human nature. So it's like... A... I, think he's, I think JQ has come to the conclusion that he's been an asshole most of his life. Yeah, and, I think I think, I think, think so, yeah. And he, he doesn't know how to fix it. He's trying to fix it. And he's trying to use these little live... Well, also, as, still, as, things, stay, as th things change, so say, things still stay the same. Right, and I sent that message to you earlier this week, and that's exactly how I felt when I saw that one post on Facebook about his live. I didn't tune into the whole thing. I know he uses them, them as his therapy sessions, but he also uses them as his soapbox to go on stuff. And I think people, yeah, uh, I get when people don't want to listen to that, but it's his platform, he can do whatever he wants. But people come on there to have his humor and do RC stuff, and yeah, I think, yeah. I'm, yeah. He, when he want, like this is what I say about JQ. When he wants to be, when he wants to be, he's good, right? When he wants to be, he can be there. He can be joking. He can talk about things. He can discuss things. Like his fucking spreadsheets last week that I fucking hate spreadsheets. 
right? But I actually <laughs> was paying attention and it made sense to me, right? Uh, that is excellent, man. That j- type of JQ's one, um, I love it. When the JQ is like, no one gives a fuck what about that, or your NASCAR, or this, or what you've been getting on. Let's talk about this. Well, that's when he tried to flex. And, you know, we guys had to kind of like, you know, you're vice, yeah. vice, vice, vice host now. You know, you. Yeah, man's, man's not even a vice host anymore. Man doesn't even vice have a hot vice. dog stand, you said. A vegan <laughs> talking about hot dog stands. Jeez, I didn't get that one. But anyway. Uh, but yeah, it was good to have him on. It's been a popular show. Uh, we had a, you know what happened in that show? We actually, yeah, came to, well, we yeah, actually, I, came I, to, I, you left. Yeah. So we came to two agreements pretty much on that show. We debated for like 30, 40 minutes, maybe 30 minutes each. And we, in the end, we both came in seeing each other's point of view and where they were coming from and how that could be applied to that with Tater. And he saw my point of view. And he said, either way, I'm good with either way. But the rule has to be consistent. And then we, we talked about Ron Afog going to FX. And uh, he even conceded that, okay, yeah, maybe if Ron Afog is going to FX to please uh, X-ray, then I'm okay with it. I, I see it. Not okay, but I understand it. So, yes, he is changing slightly. Because before, yeah. when JQ, JQ had a point, he would not. I mean, even when you when he convinced you, you be like, all right, JQ, I, I agree with you. He would still go on and on and on. But now he seems to be okay. He seems to be okay. He seems to be yeah. okay. All right. Well, enough about JQ. If you guys want to listen to more of JQ, you can check on show number 292. It ended up being 1.5 hours times two and a half, two and a quarter. So almost four hours. Max is like at like two hours. You're like, all right, guys, I got to go. That's the first time you've ever been like, I got to go. Yeah, because I, I thought it would be done by two hours, but <laughs> it, wasn't. Awesome. it was not. It was not. You guys can check it out. I put in lots of uh, timestamps as well, so check it all out. But on this podcast, we're going to be talking RC News, Wicked Weekend questions, and then other things all thrown into that. With that said, we're going to get started and get on to our high-tech news. That's right. High Tech RC has come full and in charge in 2024, and they just unveiled the RDX 1 200 ACDC multifunction smart trailer charger made for the economic racer in mind or travel racer because it's actually very small. It's good on the road, it's good on your bench. It's priced at about 80 bucks. You can pick this up at many of the different places that sell high tech around the world, around the world or America. Perfect for use on the home and the go. The state of the art AC DC charger features a compact, durable design, user friendly, intuitive, intuitive interface, and bright LCD screen. It is an easy to configure. It is easy to con- configure for all common battery chemistries while also ensuring safe and efficient charger. The RDX One Two Hundred offers a full 100 watts of power when charging from a 120. V volt AC power source and up to 200 watts on a direct current supply. It also features multiple modes to help maximize the performance of batteries and their lifespan. Check out high tech where, uh, where to buy in the link down below or check them out at your local hobby shop or wherever you buy your stuff from. And I'll check out the new RDX one 200. Thank you to high tech for the support and their support of the NNRC content coming up from the world championships, which we'll go into the more detail probably on the next podcast. All right, Maxi. So, do you want to bring up the images? Because you point on a lot of this stuff. If you are watching this or listening to this on the on the audio side of things, we are going to be posting up pictures. So maybe you want to just slip back over and check this out. It's going to be like the 18, 45 minute mark, more or less. And uh, yeah, Max, you take the show. These are your notes. You you have the team associated adjustable KPI knuckles for the B7. Thank God it's not titanium wheel nuts. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to quickly bring this up because I can't remember now, was it two episodes ago, four episodes ago? Either way, last time we did one of these news things with Keenan, we saw uh, R1 or R1 Works or whatever the brand, brand full brand is now. Um, they came up with these adjustable KPI knuckles. Uh, those are full uh, aluminium, a little bit different design compared to this. I think actually, in my opinion, a bit more sleek design, but now Associated released uh, their own plastic molded version of it with the aluminium piece to screw on. 
Um, they say here they used this sort of prototype, and now they kind of made it a production version. Uh, it, it's to me, I would kind of, I would have personally released the car with this. That's my Max. So my I am, I am ignorant and naive here. Ex briefly explain how this works because I'm really confused at these little carbon fiber pieces on the bottom here. The carbon fiber pieces are pretty much just shims. Okay. So, so where do you shim them? Of, so up and down? Well, basically this blue piece here, mm -hmm. um, that's screwed on here to the plastic one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you would attach the king thing from the bottom regularly here. Mm -hmm. And then from the top, the king thing would go to this blue mm -hmm. piece and it would be attached to the whole knuckle. And then by shimming this blue piece to, you know, it would okay, go gotcha. sort of basically like a trailing type of thing, but it's obviously a different way because you're uh, adjusting king thing uh, inclination. But basically by the shim, you adjust the points of attachment for the kingpins, which due to the fact that the knuckle or uh, the sea harbor has balls um, on the bo top and bottom, it adjusts the angle uh, and you can still move freely. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, th it's not like a new thing because we talked about this before, but now Associated released their own. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think personally, I think they probably should have released it with this. This is kind of the same style as the rear hub, but I mean, I guess. It's simpler to have just non-adjustable, probably also more durable. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got got you. All right. So uh where would you so you're adjusting the KPI? Maybe you can explain to people out there wh when you would make those adjustments and what would you what would you do to adjust your KPI? I know we've talked about it, but briefly give somebody a quick demonstration of that. Um well the thing with tool drive it's, it's still kind of an unknown territory. Because there mm -hmm. are situations where, for example, in eight scale, I never liked having, let's say, five degrees of KPI. So I'd rather have zero than five, or then I'd have like what fifteen that the pillow ball cars have. So like that's the that's kind of the tough thing for me because I I've never really enjoyed these little increments, but. Um, Basically, how the little increments would work is that um, by adding more, you're making the car more like naturally centered. So the car would go straighter when you accelerate and turn better at the deep end of the corner. It does a whole lot of uh, like things to make that happen, but mm -hmm. handling wise, you have a more easier to control car in the like the center so like when you start turning it's a better handling with more kpi so if you want more responsive you take less if you want less responsive you put more um but yeah i think like these little increments for me at least because i really like to to be in tune with my steering and some people like that as well uh so these little increments kind of they give you sometimes they give you like the shittiest of both you know so you you have a really sharp initial still like it's not as sharp as zero but it's still a bit sharp and then still you have this kind of unlinear way of steering but from from talking to people who run associated in the b7 they have been really happy with the, with okay. the ones and i think they do run actually quite high kpi depending on the conditions if you're running on bumpier tracks, usually more KPI is better. Okay. Up next is the 10 scale onward worlds that were, were supposed to be held in Costa Rica. Now going to move them, they've moved, well, they're not moved the same date, November 15th to 23rd at the huge RC circuit in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, this is the host of this. Now, this is probably where they should have had it from the get go. This place is amazing. Yeah, they. Yeah, this place held uh, 2014, the one that Hackberg won. So they've already well, hosted uh, worlds of this class. Before. Look at this track. Beautiful. Indoor yeah. asphalt. 
I, I mean, to be honest, this is where this class is probably this and Europe is where this class is at its biggest. So why not? Yeah, I, I the only downside, like the only thing that I have to say again, this is now is it fourth or fifth time it's in Thailand within the last twelve years. Yeah, but that's where the market is. So they kind of got to go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I, I mean, that's kind of like, eh, like if for a reason they have been in Thailand for so many times, but still at the same time, it's a bit annoying. And then it's only these two tracks they go to. So the track they was lost, uh, lost at in 2022, that held the world in 2012. And then this track held the world in 2014. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of rotating these two. Great facilities, like one of the best facilities in the world. Um, these two, but yeah, but that that's right. just a kind of update on the situation because we talked about it being cancelled, but never kind of. The, yeah, it's a good thing that it's, well, it's like the XPO world's not completely cancelled, not going to happen, and they must have more drivers. I would assume that it's just a bigger market in Thailand, man. Got to be, especially at a beautiful track yeah, like is, yeah. indoors and ast indoor astro. Nitro track, like I've seen this, I've seen the people post up this on Instagram and all that stuff, so it's very cool. All right, Max, up next is something that's been at a major contention point of as the races I've been going to about the upcoming worlds and people saying, Are they going to put in a new track design? Well, here you go. Uh, they posted up this on their in their Instagram stories last week, RC Redavon. Uh, that is the bottom section of the track, and it is completely demolished. Yeah. So yeah, I, I kind of it. yeah. I I, I wanted to I wanted to bring this up because I know people are gonna be like um um complaining still that it's not the same. It's, it's like people are gonna say, "Oh, that section looks like the one before, whatever." And but they are actually now like doing it as as it should be done. And uh, yeah, I don't think there's like. This is as fair as it can be for, like, as an equal playing field as it can be. Because mm -hmm. if we think about this, uh, like, the surface, uh, like, the Americans were here last time, the Asians were here last time, Aussies, everyone was here last time. The surface is going to be made most likely in the exact same way. Um, the, like, the layout, brand new for everyone. And, like, Everyone knows the tires, like the, all brands are represented well. Now that even like Baldos run J concepts, like there's no argument in that. But there's like no excuses anymore, in my opinion. Like there's absolutely no excuses anymore uh, for anyone. I actually Just, think like, J concepts will be a favorite at this race. I don't know. I don't think they have had enough time. To be the, to make a tire that's better, because like it, it takes testing and well, I mean obviously I don't know how much Rona and these guys have put into this, uh, but it, I mean obviously it could that they have had like tens of different compounds and they've just sent them to Baldo to test, and then they have that found that this is okay the direction, then done another batch, done it again. Um, so it is likely that they have had some of that, but I don't know how, like, it could be that they haven't really done anything. They just kind of done a few new ones and hope that they would be good. That's um, like probably Jason only knows that. Well, I, I've been hearing that. Well, we, we, we heard JQ talk about it, but I've heard that obviously they're going to make, um, they're making uh, new compounds and stuff specifically for this race. And what not so it's no surprise no surprise whatsoever I'm, i this is i this is what i expect this is what this is what's awesome about the world it's like this type of stuff so for me it's yeah. not a problem good buddy not a problem at all all right max anything to say else we you want to touch on the worlds a little bit more I, we do have a question about the worlds later where we could probably talk about it a little bit later on but uh uh mm. Yeah, I'm happy to see a new track. I know that they said that the front straightaway is going to stay the same and that concrete rolling section, wherever that was, is going to stay the same. They're going to incorporate it in the track somehow. So I look forward to seeing what the, what they are doing because I will tell people this, that this, 
unless until you've been to Relevant and seen the size and the amount of elevation that they have, you don't you can't contemplate how big this track really is. Yeah, how- it's like yes. like for for anyone who is from the west coast, this is like probably twice the size of uh, the uh, dirt. What you got? Well, I haven't been to the dirt, but I, I've been to what is it called Thornhill. Thunder Alley? No, 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 Thunder Alley. Yeah, it's probably twice the size of Thunder Alley. I would I'd say, say bigger than that. I think the elevation is maybe like double and then the size is probably around I w- yeah um, but maybe not double in the elevation but i would say it's more than double in the size two and a half times yeah. I well i mean if you look at from it's about one and a half very, times the elevation of of yeah of what you call it yeah but i think there's more than there's around what probably like 10 no 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 what is it 15 feet of elevation at Redovan. More than At that. Least. It's more yeah. than that. Yeah. It's more than that. It's going to be fun. I can't wait. We'll be there. We will be there. All right, Max. RC Maker, bring this up. I saw a lot of people freaking out about this. Uh, releasing new touring cars. First off, who is RC Maker? Have we talked about them before? I feel like we have. Yeah, we, I, I spoke when he released the pictures of the, the suspension. Uh, so I talked about it then. Um, let me bring up the pictures of the car so they released a regular touring car as well as the front wheel drive touring car which are pretty much now the industry standard you have to have both um can we have this on the screen as well so i can go through some of the functions yeah this is probably what we have seen before um here because I, I i talked about this when he released some teaser images so this is the sort of innovative and kind of the groundbreaking stuff he has done um so just for anyone who doesn't know it's i think his name is ryan maker i think it's ryan maker an australian uh, driver he's been driving driving for uh, automatics for the longest time i think they even sell automatics uh, his shop um and he does uh like a variety of different um um option parts and uh tuning parts and so on uh kind of always trying to like find innovative ways and i guess this is like what he said uh, on his personal page that this was kind of his long dream to make an own car and i think now now we have it here to talk about the car a bit more it's it's hard to say like what sort of new or different or whatever, but it took it's look like looks like a quite a typical um, touring car from the modern modern day. So you have uh, uh, basically the uh, active um, toe on both front and rear. Um, you have double wishbone uh, front and rear, lower wishbones made of uh, carbon fiber. Um, with then an aluminium hub that's uh, kind of like a what would you call it kind of a pivot ball type hub mm-hmm. instead of a classic you know uh, hinge pin hub it looks cool I love this brawn metal analyzing on the metal love yeah. it yeah yeah it looks cool copper I guess is it copper mm, brown. Mm. I love it it's like yeah probably like bronze Bruce Lee you know, likes so, it too but- He's he's from the dead. He's up from the grave. Bruce Lee. Yeah, he loves it. Pretty cool, man. Pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I guess in this world you don't need much. You didn't. I guess in this world things are big, like dominated by X-ray, Automatics, and Schumacher. Um, who else would you throw in there? A couple other cars. But I, I do think, like the grade on yeah. low. I think we looked at these. Puts the center of gravity down very low. My only thing would be like, I would think the shocks would get wrecked by rocks and scraped up i don't know my brain but well i think cool. i think uh because someone asked him that already within the teaser images released but i believe he said uh, that in any scenario where you know these like your you would run over a curb or whatever um the arm would touch the ground first 
unless she was like backing into something or that makes sense. obviously in the front. So it kind of like this, it would have to be like a very specific type of object the car would hit for it to stick. So, uh, and also on touring in general, like if you hit a rock, it, it's like something's gone horribly wrong before that. And with the paper thin bodies, it's like an issue already. Um, yeah, to be honest, like I have to say that I don't have enough, like I cannot look at a touring car and say like what's mm -hmm. the thing about it i think geometry wise it looks very similar to any other car uh almost all cars look look geometry wise quite uh identical barring the iris they have some sort of significant differences uh even here they have the long arms which everyone has hard to say if it's now um, but like a few millimeters narrower or wider hard to say with an eye uh but yeah it, a really interesting car and let me actually give you a video of the of the suspension function uh because i think that's sort of the most interesting part let me go full screen uh, okay um, here we go so here we have oh, it wow. So he's basically here. You can see from the top, he's pressing up with the screwdriver to show how it works. Um, let's start that over. So as you can see, uh, once you press the car down, um, the links that come from the suspension arm pivot the um, sort of uh, what is cantilever, mm -hmm. and then that. Uh, presses the shock downwards. Now, what is interesting here is that he has, as you can see from this, this image, the length between uh, the link and the sort of center of the bell crank um, and the difference between the arm that goes to the shock, it's, it's significantly shorter, I'd say, at least looking at it like with the naked eye. So what this does, it kind of, if this moves, let's say one millimeter, this moves one and a half or whatever. So mm. you can manually, um, like, well, uh, what you call it. Um, you can basically by this mechanically introduce a uh, speed into damping. So uh, gotcha. as you know, we, to we talked about this with uh, the Agama uh, that even Joseph talked about this at some point that the, damping speed is so slow that they have had to like try to like redesign like stuff around that because they, they cannot use the same pistons they used to they cannot set up the car in the way they've used to because the damping speeds are so low and they can't get the piston to work in those speeds so here um that is not an issue, even though you still have a really like short mounted link to the arm and so on, because you can adjust the um, length of the cantilever. And I even believe that you can shim the ball stud here from the cantilever that, mm -hmm. that attaches the link. So by this, you could change. Basically, this would be your like position or in the arm change or position on the shock tower change got you i got you what you mean yeah i know what you mean. you put spacers and shims there instead yeah. of adjusting the shock locations in the different holes yeah i got I, that yeah. makes sense that yeah. makes sense that's pretty cool that is actually yeah. very cool very cool seems a little bit confusing but very cool yeah i very think when cool. you see it when you see it in a still image it's hard to mm -hmm. see what moves where but when you see it moving like he shows here it kind of mm -hmm. makes total sense um, so yeah, I, I think I, I, when I first saw this, I was like, really, I'd say bamboozled because I, I wish I had thought of this, uh, before, but it's a really cool design and I hope it catches on. I see many people already excited about it, but you know, excitement doesn't always transition into sales exactly. and even sales doesn't always transition into success. But I think Ryan is one of those guys who kind of, I think he would like I would, I would buy his car, you know, like I'd buy a car for him. Uh, so 
like i'd be yeah i'd be interested to see more as they land in europe and so on so absolutely how, how all right forms. all right uh up next techno uh dropped their new e-buggy now this is pretty much based a lot uh, now did you have a look at this max because they did drop they dropped the new nitro buggy they dropped their new e-buggy i have a few questions i wanted to ask you about this car yeah uh, yeah well but, I, I actually i took a look when they released it but i didn't realize we never actually talked about uh we did not. the podcast yeah we did but not. i think most of the stuff they have already released beforehand or at least they've been driving beforehand uh, but they just haven't released it to the public because uh well they had some parts delays whatnot that they talked about mm -hmm. um I think the e buggy most of mostly the um, platform is the same. So pretty much the kit updated the front and rear end um, from what they were running. They have I have a question, Max. So I, I listened to Jared. I watched Jared Wiggins uh, talk about this car to this morning actually, and he was talking about the split shock towers. That's two things that got my attention is split shock towers with no support in between there. And then he was talking about two different types of drive axles that they use. One with a shorter, I guess, longer barrel at the end. Does that make sense? Longer yeah. axle. And then the dog burn part, I guess. Am I confused here? So this part that goes into the wheel hub, the axle yeah. part or the hub part is longer than... Like once one axle, I, I think I'm getting this right. So what one yeah, axle, think, yeah. axle length, like from that part to the dog to the the diff, than the other. So I wanted to under I wanted if you understand what I'm saying. So basically, yeah. the drive cup will be longer or shorter, and then the actual length of the axle will be longer or shorter. What do the split? Sh really quickly, let me tell me what the split shock towers do because I know they they kind of they don't have that piece in the middle that makes them rigid. And what do those those drive shafts do? Those are the two things that interested me. Yeah. So yeah, and I think those are the two biggest yeah. updates on the car. They did some hub updates, but I think those were to accommodate the drive shaft. So those two things you mentioned are also, at least as far as I'm concerned, the biggest updates on the car. Um, with the shock towers, um, obviously I, I haven't tested this myself in H scale, so take that this with a grain of salt, but. At least in 10 scale, we I remember with uh, some X-ray drivers, uh, a big thing was that on lower grip, you would uh, run plastic shock towers uh, in, in like 10 scale, and that this was to gain traction. And I kind of always thought like, how is this even a thing? But then running um, different 10 scale cars, different shock towers, there is a significant difference. Uh, in the flex of the shock tower. I can't really explain like what, why is that a thing? Why does it generate the grip? Because at the end of the day, the shock should always be, you know, softer than the shock tower. But I guess there is a point where, for example, you're exiting a corner and your rear shocks are pretty much all the way in. So th at that point, the load on the spring is quite high and that produces a tiny amount of flex on the on the shock tower and i think that sort of tiny amount of give makes the sort of tiniest movements of the shock more free and by that gives you you know more room to work with in terms of grip in terms of like in because the surface of the track is never like fully flat so there's always some inconsistency on the surface so that's why oftentimes having a little bit of give gives you a grip that the sort of shock cannot it's not fast enough kind of like running graphite shock towers on eight scale yeah. yeah yeah i get it i get it so now tell me a little bit about the drive shafts real quick yeah quick. so this is probably the thing that i'm more more knowledgeable about because i have actually actually tested this a lot with the mayako we do this quite a bit it's a big big thing for tuning so the the further in you bring the um joint of the axle so if you have a hub you have a tire and then you have the you know joint of the axle the the closer it is to the tire 
sort of the more aligned the um, drive shaft angle is to the, let's say, suspe suspension arm angle. The further in you bring from the tire, so let's that's like the outside of this is like where you, where you would have the diff gear. So the further in you bring the joint, the more aggressive angle of the drive shaft you'd have. So this aggressive angle of the drive shaft makes it so that once you go on power, you have you know you already know what it is. We have more. You have ax yeah, axle plunge. So <laughs> axle plunge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically, when you bring the joint more in towards the car, you have this generated axle plunge due to the shorter drive shaft shorter means you know obviously then that more angle more angle means that there's more sort of to bind on um for the uh, joint and this makes the car stiffer gives you more support on power because once you're on power the axle tries to be center and uh, tries to like direct itself to like the neutral location and by this, you can have a sort of two ways to look at it. So uh, a long dog bone and short axle. So the joint is really close to the tire. You have a really neutral feeling. The, the bind of the axle is really low. So being off power to on power, the difference is very minimal uh, in terms of the binding or stiffness of the car. When you go over bumps, the the nothing like binds as much so you have more smooth feeling of the bumps it's less nervous but if you need support if you need grip especially grip in in a lot of cases you want to have the axle more inwards because then you create that bind so you jet you have you can have a soft car but once you go on power and you need that support in the rear for example you can have that bind that gives you that support then so you can have a car that's naturally soft but you can get make it stiffer and give you more support that you need on power as you have the axle plunge to give you that. So, for example, on really smooth, low grip tracks, this is a huge advantage because you, you have no issue of going over bumps, but you need the absolute maximum amount of grip. So you want to have the car, you know, not floating on the track, but actually going into the track. But you don't want it to be too soft so you can still go on power and be aggressive like that. Okay. So that's that's the theory behind it, um, and I, I can't remember now if Techno had two different type of universals or two different type of CVAs, but there's even a difference between a universal and a CVA, because the CVA has more bind than a universal. Um, so even those uh, have a significant difference uh, between each other, and I think this is this is a big thing that I think a lot of brands have overlooked um so they kind of make one set of diffs and now drives and that's it uh one set of like uh drive shafts and that's it but for us at uh, mayako we have actually i think we have now we've come up with new out drives uh shorter um drive shafts and so on so even that so the out out drive being longer out even that has a difference and uh so there's much to play for, and I think Techno have noticed it as well. Um, so yeah, obviously they are playing it with as well. It's a big, it's a really big thing for tuning, in my opinion. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks, man. That was good. That was quick RC news. <clears throat> I was wondering about the Techno car because, uh, I, like I said, I watched that video this morning with Wiggins in there. So it'll be interesting to see how this car performs in Redavon coming up in September. I know. Uh, that they're having a really big push going into Spain. So it should be good. I think the whole techno team is going there. And then like Daniel Adams, Matt Walter, and all those guys. And speaking of techno, they are a proud sponsor of the NNRC. And we're going to go on to some race recaps brought to you by Techno RC and a few other sponsors. Techno RC. Techno RC is a championship winning manufacturer of high performance A scale, TED scale, nitro, and electric RC buggies and trucks. With a worldwide dealer network, USA and Europe based headquarters, comprehensive warranty program, and global race support, Techno RC is excellence in RC. 
View the full lineup of Techno RC race proven vehicles by visiting www.technorc.com. Thank you, Techno RC, for your continued support. Good luck to you and all your drivers coming up in the upcoming worlds. Also, there are supporters of the NNRC content for uh, the World Championships. Also, big shout out to Course Attack USA, your one stop shop for all things Course Attack in the USA. You can all purchase all course the all the Course Attack range of products for nitro and electric powered vehicles and accessories used by world and European champion Robert Battier. Uh, Course Attack was established in, by Adrian Bartin three times, if my world champion, oh, I think it's two times. And a five-time European champion with Oscar Jensen. Uh, you can check out more thing, more all the information you want with the website included in the bottom of this written description of this podcast about uh, Course Attack USA. Also, coming up October 18th to 20th at the Nitro Compound in Maricopa, Arizona, is the AZ Oktoberfest 2024. Uh, if you guys have not seen Nitro Compound, it's one of the most beautiful, biggest tracks we've seen in America. I know Tony Schumacher and his son put a lot of time into it. Uh, Mayfield, Spencer Rifkin, all those Arizona guys go here to test a lot as well. Uh, ooh, 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 hmm. I just remember something. Uh, they are going to have a TZO spec tire class, which is pretty cool. Uh, they're going to have a short course truck class as well. A big shout out to them. If you want to go check out a race in a cool place, uh, hit up Tony Schumacher or hit up the Nitro Compound on Facebook. Check them out. Coming up October 18th to 20th, the AZ October Fest. You know what, Max? I forgot to add something to the uh, to the uh, the news, but remind me about it when we come to the worlds and that question later. All right, remind me, remind me. Big shout out to Techno RC, Course of Tech USA, and of course uh, Tony Schumacher and the guys over there at the Nitro Compound. All right, Max. So you have a couple of races here. I don't know if we're going to go through all of these races. You have the UK race. You have the BRCA 10 scale electric off road nationals round five that happened July 27th to 28th at Torch Hampshire, New England, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, in two wheel drive, you saw Craig, uh, Lee Martin, and Tommy Hall. The title decider goes to the last race, will be decided between Craig and Tommy Hall. But so the two wheel drive is still in, in up for grabs, but four wheel drive has been wrapped up. Uh, Tommy Hall already confirmed the championship. He didn't get on the podium this weekend. It was Martin, Smith, and Craig. And uh, you said there was a good fight for the podium spots between Martin Smith and Craig. Lee Martin and Nico, Neil Craig still out there, just still yeah, that's, yeah. winning races. And that that's, I, to me that's, that's crazy because because like some races here and there, I kind of look at the UK scene and okay, like now it's the time. Like the whole brother Smith, even I think I think the name was Figs. Um, these these like new newcomers, uh, really fast drivers. You know, they're they're taking it over. You know, but then at the end of the season, it's always Craig always has a a chance at the win. Same with Martin; he can win a national title this year as well. So it is it is quite incredible, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Boots was even in the UK this past weekend racing. He was at Nemo racing there. Him and Skidmore were, were battling out at yeah. Nemo. Yeah. Uh, we we did talk about the I the Efra one eight scale uh, Nitro Buggy B yours. Big shout out to. Uh, David Todd, who won that, that was a great pass there that happened at RC Sachs in Alicante, Spain. Uh, the Asian Buggy Championships round three happened in Pine Hills Dirt Racing in Queensland, Australia. And freaking wow, Caleb Noble kicked ass. He won all three of those classes. Yeah, that's what I I was trying. I was supposed to dig some results, but I couldn't couldn't find. He won all three. That's all you need to know. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I remembered he went good, but. But I think that came a lot faster over the last year. I think Caleb has like shown quite a bit of promise. I remember we talked about it on the show. Was it a year ago already? Uh, because the, the, we had the Aussie Nats, and um, and he, I think he punted some guy a bit. I think, in my opinion, it was quite like it was, a it was him and Andrew Ford. Whatever. It was him and Andrew Ford. Yeah, At and Perth. and. And uh, that was like a whole thing because after the race, he, I mean, he made a podium, he had a good result. And after the race, he was like, I don't really give a shit. I can't remember what he exactly said, but pretty much he said, I don't really give a shit what you, what anyone thinks, but I'm good, good with it. So that like, <laughs> I mean, some would call it arrogance, but I kind of, kind of liked it, uh, the attitude a bit. Uh, so yeah, I like it. I rolled it. with it. 
yeah, he's rolled with it. He challenged these top guys, McBride and Lutz in Ibagi at the first round of the Asian Buggy Championships. So and now he wins uh, both of us at Asian Buggy Championships. I can't remember now, was McBride at this event? McBride was there. Yeah, so right. he was kind of a kind of really yeah, strong win for him. Yeah, this was a strong win. There were no, no Lutz wasn't there, but Pavitas yeah, was there, yeah, Spinrad yeah. was there. Uh, Big Bry, Bernard Zek was there. So everybody who's fast in Australia was there. Dude, you know who was like, like when they quit RC, they completely quit RC? Aaron Stringer. I just, just came to my brain because I was thinking about fast Australian yeah. guy. And that guy made a world. And then that was it. Like he hasn't done anything since and he quit. Look, that was amazing. Amazing stuff. Well, good job, Caleb Noble. Good job. Uh, we had the Afro fifth scale offered yours that happened the same time as the eight scale offered yours. I don't know, Afro, get your shit right. Because a lot of these fifth scale guys, fifth scale companies hire eight scale ringers to come in and run these. And yeah. uh, Peko couldn't go. And then, like I was talking to my buddy who has Alcon models, and he's like, Yeah, all the drivers I would usually hire, I can't hire because they're all at the eight scale euros. So, yeah. But, uh, Fubo Drive was Van Helman. That's all you have her. You have no other result. Yeah. Her. I don't know who won. I'm sure Connie will let us know who won. Uh, number who came first in two-wheel drive. Yeah, I don't but know. I mean, four-wheel drive, at least as, as far as I know, is kind of the main class at this is it? year. That's, that's, I mean, that's what I know. That's how gotcha. we do it in, in Finland, at least. I don't know if, like, other like yeah, elsewhere, scale, they have large scale in, in Finland, like where people actually race. Yeah, yeah, I think there's like um, probably around 20, 20 really. Races. Huh. Yeah. I, I'm honestly, I'm not shocked because I mean, Paco, I thought he just ran it on a European level. No, no, I mean, that's that's the class he started with. Okay, okay, so Paco ran fifth scale way before he even ran eight scale. Mm, interesting, 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 interesting uh, path for Paco coming into. Yeah, he was RC. he was running he was running touring ten scale touring and then fifth scale off road. Okay, that was his classes. But the big enchilada of the races that happened over our break were obviously the Euros, which we extensively talked about last week on show two ninety two, and the race that I went to, which was Wicked Weekend. Now I did kind of go over Wicked Weekend on Brent's Wheel and Trigger podcast when I was on there. Uh, I had the pleasure to attend Wicked Weekend has grown immensely um, over the last two years. We started doing like it was a year anniversary for us at Elite. It's like the first year. The first time I started doing commentary at an event with these guys. So it, it went off pretty well. This year was a little bit even more. It had uh, a little bit more interest. I think it had like not over 100, but it had a 650 last year. It had 600, 733 this year. It was a, the best weather that we've had at a race. It was over. It was overcast, and it was like just right. It was nice and cool. It probably the hottest it got was like eighty six, which is I don't know what it is in Celsius, but it's probably thirty six, thirty four, something no, like that. Probably like probably thirty at best. Probably. Anyway, uh, we went up there. That was my last race we was going to attend. This happens. This is one of my favorite. This has become one of my favorite races to attend. The first time I attended was last year. This year, I was expecting nonetheless. Uh, it was a little bit calm this year. It wasn't. Last year was like the sun was out. Fireworks were going off. People were having fun. We had the beach RC party. We didn't have the beach RC party this year because Brent couldn't make because he had a lipo fire. It was burnt down his house. So he had to take care of that. Really? Yes. Lipo fire and his garage. Wow, everybody was out of the house. Oh no. Yeah, but it didn't it done damage, but not that much. He could have lost his whole house. And he says just a uh, Oh, it a just the garage. Yeah, but it didn't like burn down everything. It caught on fire and something somehow it went out. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sort of those lipo batteries. Sort of those lipo batteries properly. But we got up there uh early on the Tuesday. That was like the quick turnaround. So Monday, I was trying to tell this story on the last podcast. Monday, we got into where Wicked Weekend is going to be. Monday morning, dropped off the camper on our way from Indianapolis, went back to Lake Park, drove back to that area the next day. So we got there Tuesday, got everything set up. Uh, things are a lot easier now in our race broadcast trailer, like RD trailer and where I broadcast from. 
So it's a lot easier setup. And we was ready, dude. I'm going to tell you, like, if you're ever going to come to a race, come to this one. Because it's, it's, it's very nice. Probably not. It's probably what you, the thing you will like about it is the heat. Because last year it was hot. But this year it wasn't too bad. This race is open on its sides. It's, it's, you know, got good ventilation, all that type of stuff. It's in a nice area. Last year they didn't have, uh, because they were renovating the bathrooms. This year they had the bathrooms, the showers, and everything up and working properly. So it was a good, man, I was just shocked. Like, whenever you go to these races, Max, and you come in, like, you, we get there from the beginning. So we're there Tuesday, man, nobody's there. And then people start piling in. And I remember we went out, I think it was maybe Wednesday, Thursday, we went out to go get some food. And as you drive up the hill, you look down there and you just see, I was like, man, this place is getting packed, trailers, and campus, and everything was set up. And I was just like, this is a big, like, you know, this is a big race. Every single top American top driver was there. Intermediate, they called this the intermediate worlds because it was that stacked. We had, um, <laughs> dude, we had that young kid from Israel, Harold Sanderwolf. He came over. First time ever in America racing. Right, and he, I said, "You got to race all classes." Little did I believe, little did I know he was going to race e truggy and truggy. Never raced truggy in his life till he came to America. So him and his dad, they came to me, uh, and he was like, "Hey, Keenan, they didn't know nothing about this." So they were like, "So for practice, we can go in line, go up practice, and go back behind and go again." I was like, "Yeah, as long as you go out there and turn marshal." I watched that man, that kid made his old man turn marshal all day. Dude, they ran. All fucking day, Max. Really? All day. And you know what he said to me? This is much better than European races where you sit around for four hours waiting to practice. Boom! I was like, oh my gosh, wait till I tell Max and, and these guys that. <laughs> um, and but how did they wait in line? His, he would he would go. He would go. The, the line was long, but he would go up and get his time. You know, and there was times that the line wasn't long. His yeah. dad would turn marshal for him. So he would just go right back there and turn and, and in line. Right? Well, when yeah. I say this, this young man flew all the way over there and got as much track time as he could, he could. And then I remember he comes to me and he goes, he, I said, you should probably drive your nitro car because you've been driving your e-car all this time, all this day, and I think you should drive it. And his dad goes, Where do we start our cars? And I was like, well, I mean, you can start right in your pits if you want, but I'm sure people won't appreciate that. But I said, you can pretty much start them anywhere you want. And I say this because a lot of your American races are like, well, what you mean? We can start our cars wherever. Well, and you're, a lot of European races, they have like an area where you can start your car. Like specifically go no. start your cars, tune them in and all that type of stuff. And I remember him asking me, what about referees? I was like, hey, look, man, this is America. This is Southeast <laughs> racing. I said... I said, look, Robin is racing here in the Southeast. I said, you ever watch NASCAR? And they're like, yeah, I think. I said, well, that's what it's like her, right? And I said, look, I'm not, I'm not saying go out there and take somebody out, but there's nothing wrong with a little clanging and banging. Dude, that kid was fucking fast. He TQ intermediate right for about and just missed out on like TQs of the other class. He he made the A final, he made the top five in all of his classes. He, he was battling out with some of the best intermediate. He was battling out. I never forget. It was, in Truggy, it was him, Jaden T, and Culture. So we had BC, Canada, North Cow, and Israel coming three wide down the freaking straightaway in Truggies. And then something had to give. And then Harold clipped the. He was like, he didn't even have to do it. He didn't even have to do the three wide. He was that. He was fast. Coming on, and then they clipped the uh, he clipped the end of the pit lane and shared off the left part of his his uh, his left a arm, left front arm. But that kid had a great time. His dad came up, he's like, Oh, we had a good time. He just had a little bit of bad luck, but man, he he had a blast. He'll be at the worlds too. And that was that was a relationship where I went to the e buggy world cup in Guarda, Portugal, met them, and they asked me what would be a good race to come to. And I said this. And they said, what would be the next best race to come to? And I said, well, you should try AMS. They said, we'll see. We'll see. Alex Lim was there. I think he should have ran pro. I think he should have ran intermediate. He ran pro. He was in the B-man. I think he should have ran intermediate. I think he could have won that. That's how stacked that intermediate class was. It was stacked. That was, for me, 
at Wicked Weekend, the best racing was intermediate. Best racing was intermediate and probably some of the pro B mains, like the B main with yeah, Taylor yeah. Fenster. Uh, so what happened is the track was very technical, Max, very technical. And I thought about this a lot. And I said, yes, this is why Dakota fan. It was very much like a, a it had lines were like 10 scale. So I remember sitting up, sitting up in the bleachers Thursday, I think it was just watching practice. Like, you know, just taking some time away and just sitting up in the bleachers, watching practice and set up there for about a half an hour, 45 minutes. And I watched little bump up there and I watched that kid. Well, I, I don't know if I could call him Little Bump. I got chastised for calling him Little Bump. Uh, Fai Long Win. His dad said, "Call him whatever I want." We're gonna have to make. We're gonna have to make up a new nickname for Bump. Why? Why can't you call him Little Bump? Also, oh, somebody on the. Ch- you know me. I don't. I don't shy away from the chat. If the chat's there and you want to debate, I'm gonna debate. We got all day. And one guy comes there. You shouldn't call him Little Bump anymore. And I was like, "Why?" I mean, that's his nickname. That's all I'm known him as since he was seven years old. And he goes, "I I already the race." RD two of his races once and he told me he doesn't like that name and stop calling that and I was like well I'm gonna go out and ask him <laughs> that's exactly what I said I said when I got a break I'm gonna go out and ask him dude I watched that kid so this this track had the straight away had two fucking jumps that at the end straight it was so fast Max I watched this kid come down the straight away that fucking Kyosho ELSC tune fucking murder I don't know if it's the stick ra- the stick radio, but like I'm all intent. I'm gonna video this kid. I couldn't even video him because I was just so impressive watching him drive. He would come down that straight away, dude. He would hit that first jump. Wah! And he would jump that thing so far and flat and not even ease off, Max. And that car would just almost that car almost landed in the face of the next speed jump. And he just like you can hear him on the straight away. Wah! not easing off hit that wing and then he goes into that bow and he would get on the brakes and go around that 180 and then it was just beautiful from there on out it was like all these different lines and transitions you had to make and scrubbing off speed all you heard was wank like you could hear it like wank and you could hear it like see you could see the car you could see the speed scrubbing off the car that's how good it was right and I watched him do that whole entire line and like right up to right almost to the very beginning of the straightaway again and I was like fuck there's nobody going on her as fast as that. And there wasn't. And I don't know if it was this thing. I watched Fenn go through it and I was like, everybody's making mistakes. Not this kid. He's like, wink, wink, wink. Like, it was just like, fuck. How did he do this? Right? And the only thing I'm up there thinking, and my brain's racking, I'm like, it's got to be the sticks. It's got to be the stick rate. Because the, 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 he was driving so hard, Max. When I say, like, he would drive into the face of the jump, like, like these jumps went and done something to him. Like they stole money from him or something like that. He was hitting them the faces so hard. Like, and like he would accelerate to the face of the jump and able to scrub off that speed just enough. We'd be like, wink, wink. and I was just like, fuck. So that impressed me right off the bat. That was the most impressive thing I saw all Thursday. Um, you ended the qualifying, he did that in Q1. So I'm watching him in Q1, Nitro Buggy. And I'm just a mesmerized once again. He made one mistake coming over that. It was like a word triple. It was a, two small jumps like this and then a big hump in the middle. So you had to jump, hit that, hit that jump in the middle and then skip over it. Boy, he was coming through this line doing that. He was skipping that. And he like on the last second, last lap or something, he hit and he went nurse high. And he bought that card on. And that's where he lost TQ of round one. That's it. That's where he lost TQ of round one. That's where Fenn was able to make up. And I think just after that Q1, he was never really able to get back up on that pace that he had in Q1. <clears throat> and uh, Fenn went on to, I mean, Fenn just pretty much went on to dominate the entire event. He said, I want an eight scale. Yeah. I want an eight scale Nitro event all year. I'm going to win everything. Right? Because he was at RC program a couple of weeks before that, but RC program was a little bit more Fun thing. RC Prem was good too, by the way. I, I had to. He fan was actually one of the drivers that took notes on drivers, and when he went up to make his picks for the draft, he had notes on drivers. Like he had been asking Ron, so he made his picks good. Who who he was going to pick for his for his, inter, for his electric team and Nitro team. But back to Wicked Weekend, he went like I as soon as I saw him TQ all like he didn't TQ Truggy, Brandon Rose TQ Truggy. I don't think anybody, the only person that I thought had anything for, for Dakota Fenn and pro Nitro Buggy was, was, was Little Bump, but that went away when he didn't qualify well. And then in the start of the mains, like 
You can see Mayfield tried to hang on to him, but it just, it just wasn't working. Like nobody was beating Fan this week, this weekend. Last year he won yeah. it on the last on the last couple of corners, taking it away from Seth Van Dalen. This year he goes completely dominated and swept everything. So a good win for and like the thing about it, the guy came up and was like, his fucking he the pit smacks. Like Fan can go fucking 10, 11 minutes with that new yeah, engine. That's- that's pretty insane. Like, I don't really know where that comes from because, I mean, Genoa is the most based engine. There's nothing that special about it. He, I think he just runs it, like, extremely lean. You know what? That's pretty much it. He has Ultimate Racing is also a sponsor of our NNRC content coming up at the Worlds. We should ask Roger about that. Yeah, maybe we maybe we talk about that because that's that's been something that no one else has been able to do. Even Mayfield, I think he has kind of struggled, struggled to go along. Uh, well, I mean, that's not really news, but uh, yeah, it's no one really has anything to to challenge him with the with that. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, but he he te- the, and the most hubbub was we talked about this already. <clears throat> Maybe you could give your your synopsis real quick on the Tater versus Fenster uh, pass. But if you guys want to learn more about Jake, you and I said, but Max, what was your thoughts on that? Um, can't now remember too much. I think Tater was a little kind of later over over ambitious, mm-hmm. but also I don't know. I guess in some way, Fenster kind of put himself into a spot where that could happen to him. And yeah. like we all know, it's it's like Tater would not get a penalty. You're really vulnerable if someone is in front of your rear tire on the inside. So you're like, you're the one that's going to fly over. So I think every time someone kind of sticks their nose in high speed inside, you kind of, either you, you are going to crash or you have to give them space. Um, and as long as there are no judges, I don't think there's anything you can really do about it. Because that's sort of the thing that it's really well, hard to see. He said it's all right with it. He saw it. He said, "No, I'm good with it." Okay. So he was on my, he was on my side. Like so, I said, "Jake, you had a ruling where he agreed on both sides of the thing." I'm telling you. Um, yeah, I think I think if we want to improve racing culture, then I think you should penalize Tater. But if we're fine with the racing culture we have, um then I don't think you should penalize him because there was a gap in there. He didn't drive into him. It just like the lines uh, collided. Uh, So, yeah. It's kind of like when you go to certain areas in Europe, you know race is going to race you harder. But I think it's the case in America, just regions. You come to the Southeast, people race a lot. So we prepared to put your elbows out. Yeah. And race. Um, yeah, I think I think it, it's kind of also a situation type of thing. So I, if I'm not wrong, that was four position at the end of the race, right? No, it was that's that is the that is the thing about it. That was for the final bumper spot with eight minutes ago. So oh well, it, then that's that, it's silly. That's silly. Then that's yeah. where the caveat is right there. That's where the caveat is. Yeah, because if if that was let's say these two were considerably in the lead so they had like let's say 10 second gap to the next car uh or more like 15 second gap to the next car they was finding for the win they knew it was going to be either like this guy or the other guy who was going to win this, okay and then you have like a few minutes to go at that point you kind of try to take your chances try to like find gaps to obviously that helps you attack as the attacker and it kind of makes the car in front more nervous so in situations like that i think you can be a bit more aggressive take a bit more risk and sort of lean into the other driver Mm -hmm. but if you're driving like mid-race and you're in a pack especially if you're in a pack sticking your nose in like that it's it's stupid because it's going to cost you because next time someone else will do that to you. Because I know for a fact that there are drivers that if I drive behind in a pack, that you know I'll I'll drive more aggressively behind them because I know they would do that to me. 
And there are drivers who I know for sure I will not drive aggressively around in a pack because I know they wouldn't do that to me. So I think looking at these both two, both of these two are I think are quite young. They are gonna meet again. If I was Fenster, I know for a fact that next time I was in a pack and I saw Tater going wide, I would stick a, a wheel in, pull a bit of brake so I know my car won't get unsettled and throw him <laughs> off the track. You know, because that that at some point. Yeah, because that that's kind of I think this type of incident is one of those. It's not necessarily that that was a Tater takeout, but I think he's just disrespecting the yeah, no, no, but I mean, like, yeah, yeah, but I think this is not like, oh, this is 100% takeout, you should penalize Tater. It's more so that Tater disrespected the car in front by putting a nose in in a situation where there really wasn't a way to overtake. That was just a like place to show that you're in there, and Fenster kind of didn't, like, drive safely enough. Because I think even if Fencer let gave him space, he would have still kept the position. So, for his sake, he could have handled that situation so that they, that even wasn't an incident. But that takes you to know that okay, this is this guy behind me, and okay. he's gonna drive this way. Mm. And I think this is kind of why you know, for example, um, at RCGP, it was really apparent where there was drivers who took. It. Yeah, where drivers took each other out. Uh, and then, you know, obviously that re favor was returned. I, for example, took Lee Martin out fucking 10 times, I think. And that, that was like not intentional. It was kind of, we always happened to be in a place where uh, I was driving too close to him. We drive in a very different way and I took him out. Uh, and then he you returned the favor. <laughs> All right. Um, but enough about that because you kind of beat that, that, ho that horse to death last week. Yeah, um, I do agree with your points. It was a great weekend for Dakota Fan. Ryan Lutz finished second. I didn't even realize that till just now. I thought I thought Fan. I thought that Mayfield finished second and Lutz finished uh, third. But great weekend for Lutz. He was very solid all weekend in Nitro Buggy. Ryan Mayfield not gonna be happy with that third. Seth Van Dalen, who almost won this last year, probably he had a very quiet weekend. He did have some good runs in qualifying in other classes. A steady fourth. Brandon Rose, steady Freddy in top five. Mason Fuller turning a 12 into a six. Uh, Jared Wiggins had a solid weekend in seventh. Lee Setzer, eighth. Mornhorse, Rifkin, Cavallari, Jermaine Robinson, who was good all weekend. Uh, Tyler Jones, part time racing, not agreeing with him. He was not able to, he was my dark horse, wasn't able to really do much. Uh, intermediate, like I said, was where a lot of the action was. I just wanted to give a few shout outs to some people. An intermediate Ashton Abdul it was good to see him. He came on, he raced intermediate, he won e buggy and nitro buggy, but he was kind of gifted uh nitro buggy because uh Red Piggott was leading that race immensely, and then his mom was pitting him. He came in for a few a, a, a young man from Virginia, Ron Stackner. His mom was pitting him, did a perfect pit, and I think when he when he drove out. Probably just to give him enough time to clear the engine out. I'm not sure. But he kind of drove out and got to that bell and he flamed out. Or well, I might have got to the... I can't remember. And that kind of just gave Ashton the lead. And he won. And then in Truggy, it was another heartbreaker because Cole Truer... I, and I will never say this again as an announcer. I was like, 60 seconds left to go and Truer has this in the bag. Da, 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 da. Car flames out. Then on the straightaway. Less than 60 seconds to go. So congratulations to those guys. Uh, it was a good event. I enjoyed myself. I know there's a, always a lot of chatter about sandbagging and all that stuff after a race time event. Uh, there are no real rules considering like, not, well, if you're sponsored, you can't be in this. Sponsorship does, can't run sportsman. Sponsorship does not equate, equate to, to level, uh, sorry, to skill level. Uh, this also leads us to our NNRC cup points that we're going to go over real quick, uh, briefly after this, but it was a good event. I think if anybody's on the fence of coming to a good event, uh, why well, I say it's a good event, there's places of there's camping available. There's good bathrooms. They have a great, uh, they have a great onsite, like a food truck comes They have good food. The surrounding area has good food around it. It's an hour North of Atlanta. It was a good bit of entrance. People seem to have fun. And then Sunday it was done. Like Sunday, 7.30, done. 
Everybody was gone. Everybody was leaving. It's amazing. Always how that happens. Always how it happens. Congratulations to Kota Fan. He takes the win. Uh, very good momentum going into the World Championships. I know people yeah. say it doesn't matter, but if it does matter in my it brain, does like, yeah, it, it does, does matter. matter. Like he's in there. Like I beat those guys. Uh, he hasn't had a victory, an eight scale victory all year in, in Nitro. So that was good for him. And like I said, dude, he looked like he's just another day at the office for Fan. Just like, yep, yeah, you know, I'm having yeah. fun. Not even getting flustered. Yeah. Um, I have a so, few points I want to make. Okay. Uh, of, the, of this observation. So, number one, um, Jonah Wilson. I think it was AMS last year. Joseph said, oh, this kid is going to be fast, or whatever he said. This year, multiple podiums, multiple top finishes uh, in e-buggy, sure, but still multiple big results. He, he's second here. Uh, in e-buggy um so and also he i mean he's now consistently always in the main i'd say if i'm not wrong in nitro buggy so it's not like oh he's only good in e-buggy he's also good in nitro buggy but nitro buggy is just a more difficult class to be at the very top um so jordan wilson a big step up since last year i don't know what happened but big step up so i have to say that out loud so we realize that because i think we talk about it here and there, like we're surprised about him, but he seems to be proving himself each race now, each race time event at least. Um, another name, Lutz. Um, I don't know how, but he seemed to be kind of consistently around like, let's say third to seventh last year. In American races. So he was always around there, never really fighting for the win, but he was always around there. This year, though, it really like he was 10 seconds behind Fend at the end. Um, really not that far behind on pace. Finished second, beat Mayfield. Uh, granted, Mayfield had a tough race, but still. And in Ibagi at the third. And it's not like this is his favorite race where he always does good or whatever. But I think Lutz's level has considerably, you know... Risen. Risen, yes. And also on top of that, he's able... Like, in the past, he was able to TQ around, let's say. Mm -hmm. But these days, I feel like he's able to... If he's, let's say, a little bit behind Fend maybe around speed of Mayfield, he's able to qualify second or third every round, you know? Because in the past, he would have like a first and a ninth or whatever. But now I feel like he's more consistent. So that's really impressive. Um, Mayfield, talking about Mayfield now, I think I, I if I was like, okay, I'm not him. I don't think he's worried. But Looking at him at this race, um, I don't know what's, what was going on. He didn't really look like himself at any point. Um, kind of off all weekend. And it cannot be like, oh, it's tires, because he's running the same tires as Dakota. I think uh, it's just a track, track, man. You track think was very, the track was hard. The track was very hard to yeah. pass on. Um, and the track, I heard a lot of people say it was just hard. Like that whole rhythm yeah. section you had to get right. It was like more than half the track, you know? And if yeah. you just made a little bobble, it cost you tenths of a second. And 10 scale, like fans really good at a 10 scale stuff. And it, and that's what I think you could compare it to is like a 10 scale track with the transitions that you needed and all that type of stuff. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think actually that's a really good point. Because if we look at Mayfield, where he practices, he practices in Arizona. Mostly it's dry, bumpy, not really smooth tracks like this. Um, and he's been doing good. At, I mean, that uh, was similar to this. Similar. It was similar, but it, mm -hmm. the surface was very different. It wasn't like smooth. You could slide the car around. It was not uh, hugely bumpy, but the, the surface really like rough and inconsistent and abrasive. And then, like, if you look at any races he's won this year, always at a, quite a rough track, barring PNB, obviously. 
Um, but then that track wasn't as technical. So I think that's actually a really good point that Fend is much better when it's tight turns, fast accelerations, not really and, about and carrying corner speed. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, you have to carry trans yeah, sorry, excuse me. I'm sorry, Max. You had to carry corner speed and have maintained that rhythm of that those transitions that you need to make. It's yeah. kind of like you know what this reminded me of the last year's nationals track. We had to go through well, that left hand yeah, section yeah. of the track, and you had to get all those jumps time properly. If you misjumped it or missed it by a few inches, it, it sent it cost you tens. And Fench is good at that. He's really good at that. And uh, it should. And I think Fen goes into the worlds on a high note. And if you don't think that these guys are taking the world serious, Wiggins and uh and Mayfield were on at Thornhill this past weekend racing and yeah. practicing. So it's good to see. Oh, yeah, good there are. See. I think I think Mayfield really is looking to have a world championship in age. I think oh, that's yeah. really Absolutely. like if he wins the worlds now, I wouldn't be too surprised if he kind of eases off. He'll go on as the best year. ever. He'll probably go down as one of the best ever, if not the best. One of the most favored. I mean, he'll all, he'll go down. Sorry, yeah. let me let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. He will go down as one of the best ever. Period. Not having yeah. if he doesn't win a world championships, but if he wins a world championship this year, he will fucking not. And he would he would be like on the Mount Rushmore. Like he'd be there, right there, like Mayfield's face, right there. I'd say he would Mount definitely Rushmore be Mars. the. Best American of his era. Yes. Yes. And he is in an era of American, a lot of fast American and European racers. An era of yeah. a lot of fast guys. Yeah. So it's going to yeah, be very... You, yeah. I have to it's say... It's very like, good to see him taking it seriously. Yeah. All yeah. Right. yeah if, if you look at him, like, it, the only two who'd come close, let's say... Of of the Americans who have raced from two thousand like three onwards, two thousand onwards, it's basically between Cavalier, Tebow, and Mayfield. Like there's yes. no other who even comes close. And Tessman. I think of those well, okay, yeah, Tesman, Tesman and Fend, obviously. Um uh, but like from those, I think Cavalry has never been as good in eight scale, he hasn't really proven himself ever in eight scale. But in a consistent all in 10 scale, he, yeah, he's he's, 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 he's got him copped yeah. in, in 10 scale, yeah, and yeah, Gavrilari has won many eight scale races, including he in has, Europe. yeah, yeah, and Euro Nationals, Europe. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's right. not like he's not there, but I think, yeah, Mayfield would still get my title because he's won so much. Um, either way, uh, I think Mayfield has been the better later in his career. Which is oh, oh yeah that that's that's no doubt which um, is impressive yeah but that's a tangent we could go on for hours uh, one thing I still wanted to say was about the track I I think these type of tracks are really cool I think you know last year's weekend weekend I was kind of I can't remember now what I said but I said about the at least the bump section like I never liked those. They're kind of just like random generators. You just go into a, a section, you put your car in it, and then, you know... Random you number generate, generator? Yeah, like it, it generates your number of seconds, how much it took you to get by it. <laughs> it's not really about like more, much more than that. Obviously, there's some skill to it and blind picks, whatever, but at the end of the day, it's very random. And I think this year's track at Wicked Weekend had none of those. I think the layout was... Overall, very good last year. Hard. Yeah, but I think I like this year's layout really, really much. Okay. I can agree with you there. The only yeah. thing I didn't make for was good racing. It, it had good racing yeah. in the back of the back and in the lower classes. But it's like, dude, I, I consider like intermediate, like college NFL or college football versus NFL football. Highly skilled professional NFL guys who could do anything, but also have to worry about making a living for themselves versus intermediate guys who are like, this is my last time ever racing, ever playing football. I'm going to sell it, Billy Bob, and fucking well, going out there and, and kicking ass. It was great. It was, it was a good event. I, I hope you guys come in the future. I want to thank Dave Lycom for having us there. We had a blast. Ricky Beacon was awesome. It was a good event. It was a good event. I want to take my son oh, by back. By the way, 
only oh. one podium for an SRX driver. So they have been the best sort of, I'd say they have easily been the best brand in America this year. So probably the worst weekend so far for Team SRX. Well, a fifth. Yeah. Top five, which is a podium at these races, which is a podium. Oh, okay. Races. Yeah. But I mean, I meant like Rose was third in Chuggy. But. All right. Uh, if you have been following the podcast, we have been doing some NNRC Cup points. We've brought this back. It's a virtual series. Now, I, I, it's my fault. I have not made a post about this in a while. But the points are updated though, on the Elite RC Productions website or EliteRCP.com website. In fact, all of our work that we're going to, all of our written work and everything that we post on Facebook, Come Up for the Worlds, will be available on Facebook, but also be under the Elite RC Productions web page as well. So you can follow all of that. So here we have, I want to say a big thank you to Elite RC Productions for their support of this, as well as the American Top 25 Rankings who have been doing our points for him, which is Mike Full and his wife. And here's our Pro Series after. So the Pro Series is more races, and they only get two drops. I really want to include the Worlds in this, but that's... I, I don't think we... I, I think, okay, here's why I think we shouldn't. Because if you look at the points now, it's 116, mm -hmm. 115. With one drop, uh, yeah. So, if we have worlds now, let's say Fender Mayfield has a bad result, we go to AMS and the title is well, the NNRC Cup title is decided. Okay, but if we don't do the worlds, the title decided would be AMS, right? Because there are no other American races left. No, there are not. Uh, and then on top yeah. of this this would be 100% on american soil okay and i think i think so it, it would race hold on go ahead i'm just calling it. yeah so i think that's why we should actually just do um ams now no worlds just ams okay because then we would actually have a showdown we could like actually have a showdown of who was the best driver in american soil because it's right if you look at this and if you look at your, like, look at our feelings of, over the year, it's not like it, it is between Mayfield and Fan, and it's not clear cut. You could say one, no. like, one was the better or the other, but it's not clear cut. And uh, yeah. Well, so Mayfield has. So if you. Mayfield you, has more wins. He has two. Mayfield wins. has more wins, but he had that DNC that hurt him. He had a 13 at DNC. Right, yeah. I don't have the equivalent to what that finished as 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 it was, but Fan has not finished out of the top three the entire yeah. year in Nitro Buggy. So you exactly. see, he has a twenty sixty one, a twenty three at Nats. He came second, I think twenty one. He finished third. DNC finished third. SIC finished second. PMB finished second. So consistency is paying off for Fan because even if this was with no drops, he's in the lead by far over Mayfield. But with yeah. one drop, because I'm giving him one drop, he uh, he's only one point ahead of Ryan Mayfield, 116 versus 115. If this was just points with no drop, it'd be 137 versus 128. Brandon Rose is in third. He's got 96 points. Ryan Lutz has been in fourth the entire year. Mason Fuller, fifth, which I think is about right. I would have the... I would switch... Ooh, well, Rifkin just had those bad results, right? When you, you can... This is the... This is the story of the tape, right? You can look at the, the points here and look at the position where they finish. And that's where they've been going wrong. Joe Bourne was in eighth, Van Dalen in ninth, Fi Long in tenth, uh, Cavallari in eleventh, and Lee Setzer. Rana Falk still in there because he went to two American races. But Dakota Fenn showing that consistency is key in winning a championship. But we know this, right, Max? We know all of this. We yeah. know all of this. This is why we won a championship. Let's have yeah, a quick look yeah. at intermediate points as well. Uh, so intermediate points have been updated as well. So this is where it gets kind of murky with points, right? And I know you're on the other side of this. So I did not take into effect the points, the, the amount of races and the different level of races that there would be. So here you have Wicked Weekend, Pro-Am, North Georgia Shootout, PNB, SIC. Um, Trent is currently in the lead. We have no drops whatsoever right now. He's also attended uh, one, two, three, four of these five races. 
Mad Matty Long is in second. Mike Legee is in third. You see, he didn't make wicket. He didn't make pro round. But he gets four drops. I'm, I'm not, not sure any drops of these, but I think it's going to be four drops. So you have to attend four of these races. The issue is with races like RC pro Am, North Georgia Shootout, they're not on the same level nationally as a PMB or SIC. So a lot of these guys run pro in this class. So guys like uh, Don Elliott and um, where's his name? Uh, Will McIver. You usually run intermediate at these races, round pro at these races. So that's where they lose their points. But they can still make up for points by running intermediate at the future races. So Trent Walker, is he running away with it? I think he's going to North Georgia shootout, and I think he's going to MAS, AMS. And if he's going to AMS, he's probably going to end up going to fall brawl. So probably going to walk away with it just through consistency, right? Not yeah, winning. But I mean, he has, he has to win. He won at pro -Am. But a win, this is, now this, this sounds bad. The, the competition level at pro -Am isn't as high as the competition level at Wicked Weekend. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but that, that's that's why I would have done it so that you would only count the race time events. Um, I, I think that I was trying to do it where I included I 100% agree with you. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, yeah. and sportsman, you bring up a question that we tease him about quite a lot, including his yeah. best friends. Uh, it's Jake Lasko. And let me tell you, Jake Lasko and Trent are taking these points seriously. So Jake right now is currently in the lead in Sportsman Nitro Buggy. His worst finish is at Wicket, where he had 11. He did make the A final. Uh, he's won. He won one North Georgia shootout. He did a 12 at PNB. So on the regional levels, Jake does well. You know, Pro-Am, North Georgia shootout, those small events, he does well. The competition bumps up in Sportsman. He finishes a little bit lower than the the grid, okay, he had a good SI. I think he finished third. But he's rewarded with 93 points. Josh Fine is in sec. He's missed two races. He's either missed two races or he's not made um he's not made the point spread. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have you get points to a certain number. Alex Cummings, same with him, was doing very well in the in the in the Nitro Buggy standings. At Wiki Weekend, he was in the B, like last in the B main. So he doesn't get into the where he co collects a point for that race. Cam Hamill, he, Cam Hamill's been fast all year. So it's 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 good to see this type of stuff. And you asked the question, is Jake Lasko a sandbagger? We tease him. Look, <laughs> dude, our friends tease him about this. Josie Patashaw and all these lot tease about him. Oh, he's, he's a sportsman driver, man. He's going to get swamped in intermediate. He's not as good as the intermediate guys. He's the gatekeeper of sportsmen. And as you can see at Wicked Weekend, where there was more talent, he didn't win. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, when you look at the points here, you can see that he's not really, he belongs in Sportsman quite actually because he's not even close to winning these big events. But I think this, this again, once again, proves that why Sportsman and the division between Sportsman and Intermediate is silly because, like, when it's a small event, People just decide that I'm no longer a sportsman. I'm actually intermediate. But then when it's a bigger event, they decide again, okay, I'm actually a sportsman at this event. So how, how does that make any sense? Because um, I think there should be, you know, a certain level of, of like actual drivers. So if you're... So the race if, if there, that level. Yeah, like if you look at like, okay, let's say... RC Pro Am had uh, 15 pro drivers. They did. Seven of how many pro drivers they had? They didn't have 15 top pro drivers like a wicked weekend. That's what I'm trying they, to tell you. Uh, yeah, yeah, but different. like, like would would uh, Pro Am had a full main for pro class without the intermediate drivers running in it? No. How many would they have had? They didn't. Have, they didn't have enough. They had to pull 40 plus guys in to do the draft. Because they were so okay. many people want to get drafted, so they guys who ran forty plus were pro and had their teams. They just got scored okay. for their forty plus positions in the forty plus race. No, because these races are still small, right? They're not. You gotta yeah. understand that race time has been doing this for many years and built out the prestige, and that's where all the races go now. You know, to yeah. these four yeah. events. So, not saying that these races can't get there, but I think this is the we're coming up on the third edition okay. of the Georgia Pizza Classic. 
So they just don't get that level of competition to come to them on the pro side. Okay, here, here's here's the solution. I'm going to give okay. you the solution, how you do this. So let's say you're an event like RC pro -Am. You don't have a pro class. Just don't have a pro class, okay? You have, you know, intermediate. Oh, I recommend for the NNRC Cup. I, look, we're not, we're not going to rewrite the book on classes at the race. I thought you meant for no, the NNRC not no, no, race. but okay, but but like if you you just said they don't have enough drivers for a pro class. No, like wh why would they? Like, uh, let me check a live RC. Like RC so, for instance, North Georgia Shootout didn't have any top pros there. None. Uh, let's see. Final results. Pro Nitro buggy. So there was. Tater Sontag and Dakota Fend, Camden yeah, Lime, Heckert. I think is Daze like um no pro he's, level driver. He's he's top intermediate at most. He run he run, he ran intermediate at the other races, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. So basically we had 14 drivers, which of uh, 10 were intermediate drivers in reality. Okay. Or worse. Oh, oh, worse. Okay, so we're forty plus drivers. If they're running forty plus only. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So why? What's the point of having a pro class? So at, at this event? race is a little different, Max. This place was the pro class was having the team event at Pro Am. That's why. Okay, but they wouldn't probably have the team event if they had enough entries. So if you want to go to a race that that had no real pros, was North Georgia Shootout. It didn't have. I think at any pro drivers there, but they still have a pro class. So, yeah. okay. look, I'm not even. Okay, I'm not me... trying to. I'm not trying to fix it. I'm not even trying to go on about it. We've beat well, this. Let me say it's, a, it's it's a quick one. Okay? So many times. So when you have this small event, okay, you run everyone in the same like the intermediate and pro in the same class. Because what's the well, like what's the issue? Like there's if there's less than ten pros. It's not gonna really matter at the end of the day, because like, if you have enough pros to run a full main, then you give them a class, okay? But having this sort of divide between you have to decide you're on pro intermediate, that's that makes no sense. So or rather run everyone in the in the same class. Still have sportsmen if you want to. Sure, do that if you really want to. But at least that way. It's kind of at least always the same. So these guys who run intermediate run intermediate, and these guys who run sports run sportsmen. If you want to like give trophies to these guys, you can say that okay, Ben and Sontag they get trophies for the pro class, but then the guy who finished in reality third, but it was the first intermediate driver wins the intermediate class. Okay, so do that. That's what they do in full scale racing. You know Le Mans. All of the cars run the same race, but they just give the trophies to those who were in the club. And with more than 15 drivers in the main, it's not like someone's missing out that either. Um, so that's my opinion on how you should do these races that are small. Because this way, also for the pros, there's an incentive to get other pros involved. But they they want to they they can go to this race they're they they're guaranteed that there's going to be enough drivers in the class and then for the future they can say okay this is a nice event they do this and this and this and this and this and then their friends will come like like fend and fend probably and some tag they were like okay team losi goes next year there's going to be that team tech team team maybe yeah so, well, anyway, I, so like, th I think I think that's the way to go forward with a uh, situation like this. And also it makes our life easier at the uh, Northern Morsi podcast. Absolutely. Uh, to be honest, now now that I look at this, I think we should have actually counted these because I thought there was going to be actually more uh, pro drivers, but there actually wasn't. There was almost no pro drivers at all. For exactly. Count. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe you could so, come up with, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? A... Different rendition of that rule. Think about it. Think about it. But if you want to check out more NNRC virtual cup points, you can check them out on the Elite RC Productions website, EliteRCP.com. Uh, thank you for all that. It's just for fun. We're just trying to see how it all peters out and how it all ends. If there was an actual series, series by points.
All right, Max, it's time to get onto some questions because we have a few and I want to get through a good bit of them. So it's time for the beach RC bench racing Q and a, as soon as I find my. Okay. We before we go, let me say something. Mm -hmm. um, I just looked at the times and uh, Trent Walker would have finished third in the pro class. He won the intermediate class. So that's how fucking stupid it is. Oh, you mean at the at the other class? Pro, -am. pro -am. Yeah, but you understand trend. that 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 was not a. I get what you're saying, but that wasn't a fully stacked pro class. No, no. But what I'm saying is that even if we did what you initially suggested, that um, we would, you know, account with the pro drivers down. So like, let's say Will MacIver and these guys uh, who are running pro, but usually run intermediate, these guys would not even have finished top five in intermediate with their times. And they run straight after. So it's not like the track deteriorated a bunch. I know what you mean. Yeah. At what? At RC Prime, you betcha boots it did. You betcha boots it. That track changed a lot. Uh, but anyway, okay. I get what you're saying. It's time for Beach RC. Bench racing, Q and A. BeachRC.com, the racer's one-stop online hobby shop. Choose from all the popular brands and variety in stock with super fast shipping and great customer service. BeachRC.com still has the local hobby shop feel with all the benefits of the internet. BeachRC.com is the exclusive distributor for Ultimate Racing S Works, Pro Circuit Racing tires, Nitro Lux fuels, and Assault RC performance products. So fill up your cart and check out at BeachRC.com today. That's right, everybody. Thank you to BeachRC for their continued support. We have affiliate links in the written description of this podcast for BeachRC. Check them out, use them, and help us out. Max, we have a few questions, and I'm going to let you go. The somewhat science mode, as soon as I find this, right off the bat, right off the bat. Do you like that? Do you like that? All right. Because this created quite a stir, or a stir on the internet webs yesterday or day before. When Mayako posted that uh, picture of the brake bias with 100,000 in the center diff. So people have been asking about that. So I had one question asked. I've noticed a trend of much thicker diff oils in 1.8 scale cars even on lower grip tracks. What's up with that? That's from my buddy Jimmy Woodley at Classic RC Company. Well, um, a lot of it comes down to the tires we run, I'd say. Um, so it doesn't really happen on tracks where you run pin tires. So you don't run like incredibly stiff diffs when it's on pin tires. And it also comes down to corner speed. So you really need to have the drive, keep up the drive uh, around these fast-paced corners. Um, and by, by having thicker diffs, it makes it easier to do that, especially during long mains. Um, on top of this, um, there are brands that have multiple different types of uh, gears in, within the diff. So for example, Mayako, we have really small uh, tooth gears in our diffs. So thicker oil is not actually, at the end of the day, that much thicker uh, or stiffer for the diff. Um, then there are Techno, for example, who I think they have even three different types of gears. Uh, Associated has two different types. Um, so that, for example, is already one thing to note about that that makes a big difference. So 100K in Mayako diff, probably close to like a 50K in some other brand, which is normal for Ongaro. He runs thick diffs like that. Also then, when the heat diff he heats up and when it's on driving, then the handling is a bit different. So you have to even compensate for that when you have smaller gears. So you kind of have to run two uh, thick diffs um, for small gears, uh, small gear diffs um, when it's like a smooth, smoother track. Um, the thing about our diffs 
uh, or diffs in general, the way they work is we don't have a function that would lock them, essentially lock them where, whilst we're going power. Um, so it's a trade-off. We, we have to make the decision of, do we want the diff to be open diff, which is uh, optimal for really tight corners, or do we want it to be basically a locked uh, axle, which is optimal for acceleration? And full-scale cars, they have these active diffs, who, which lock when you go on power, and then they open while you go off power. Well, we don't have that option, so we have to make a trade-off. Now, obviously, um, if you always want to drive, then you don't always go to the thicker diffs. If there's bumps, however, the thicker diffs make the handling of the bumps much worse. So uh, it's less forgiving. Uh, even off power, it's less forgiving when you have a thick diff because when you go, when the other tire goes over a bump and the other doesn't, it still tries to drive the tire that's going over the bump and so on. Same with center diff. If the front goes a bump where you doesn't, it doesn't really forgive as much. So it gives you more, you know, push from the ground because the diffs try to the oil in the diff tries to resist that. So that's basically the the trade-off you're working with. So if you have a track that's high grip, you're gonna need a thicker diff because obviously the you, you're gonna have diffing out you're gonna need drive because there's grip where you can use the drive so you want to use as much of that as possible then you have to look at okay i can go as thick as i want pretty much as long as i have steering so if the track doesn't have any tight corners you can go quite high if it has then you have to kind of balance it out then if you have bumps you look at that do you need easier car to drive or like because there's bumps that make it difficult or is it just the surface smooth so can you go to thicker dips and it's not only grip dependent because as long as you have a smooth surface um, and the rotation of the car happens in a way where it's not dependent on um, you know your diff sort of working properly it's more dependent on the rear and rotating around having really thick diffs doesn't really give you a disadvantage at that point so you don't get the disadvantage of the car not rotating or you do but it's it's very minimal but you still get the advantage of the really high amounts of drive and with that some corner speed as well um because you have a more um you have a more you know smooth smoothly turning car so it doesn't really scrub the speed you have um so if you look at European tracks, the glue, the oil, so on, really smooth. And the car rotates naturally quite quite a lot. Thanks to the tires we run, it's allowed to, you know, slip. And uh, it's not bumpy. So there's really the disadvantages uh, of the thick diff have been decreased by the tracks we have. And the advantages have remained or even increased of having a thick diff. And that is simply why it's you see that much more often. In America, I bet you don't see that much, because especially in the West Coast, because those tracks, it's so bumpy, it's so low grip. You really need all that grip and like uh, forgiveness as you can get. So in those situations, you can't really take advantage of. And like well, this is kind of a tangent again, but Ongaro is a great example of mind that it's, tangent here, Max. You already yeah. been five okay. Five it's, it's, shit. okay, but it, this is a good one. So Ongaro, for example, he was one of the ones who did this first. So already 2018, 20, probably 17, he was running really thick diffs compared to other drivers. And people were like, How can you even drive this? Um, but he drives a car which rotation happens from the rear. So the rear end is really slippery. He doesn't have an issue with uh, the rotation due to the thick diffs. Okay, so he's eliminated that. The track's not bumpy in Europe. Uh, no issue with that. He has a lot of drive with the diffs and he can get the full advantage. Then he comes over to America. He 
tries to set up his car in the same way, tries to use the advantage of the drive he has, tries to have the car set up the way he likes to drive, the way he can make it fast. But it's much more difficult. It's really difficult to drive on a track like that with bumps and low grip. So you don't have really like, you don't have a lot of grip to use, so you have to be careful with the throttle and you have the bumps that make it even more difficult to drive. So he makes a lot of mistakes. He's fast still, but he makes a lot of mistakes. Like we saw at DNC, like we saw at RCGP. Uh, he was always fast at best lap, but he was making a lot of mistakes. And that's why, a big reason why he suffers in America, because the way he drives is centered around having a lot of drive, centered around the rear end rotating the car. And that's kind of sort of the new style that we're going towards. And most drivers who go to thicker diffs enjoy this style. And it's not as like, it's not like you have to drive this way to enjoy thicker diffs. Most drivers will on tracks like this because the, the advantages overpower the disadvantages. But that's just an example of a driver who kind of took this route early on and took all of the advantage out of it, even though some people were not able to at that time or in those conditions. So yeah, that's probably why we are running thicker diffs. It, it's much like the issue I could talk about for hours and different situations and so on. But that's that's a big reason why. Uh, and also, like if you look at a Mayako, you have to remember we have much smaller gears than that brand. So for example, associated with the big gears are really big. So yeah, it's different. All right, 10 minutes, that's enough. You already used up all your science mode for today. <laughs> okay. That's it, that's it. Colts RC, Wings, I never drew giant hills in mind, but the fast do, am I doing this all wrong? What up with Wings? Quick, easy. Um, the it depends which body you run uh so you should test it out for yourself so for example the bodies i run the ones i've made myself um the there's quite a bit of like the wings of the, the wings on the body are quite far forward so the balance of their dynamics is quite far forward of the body so if i drill uh holes to my wing the rear end becomes really slippery because i have moved already the balance forward so most rc bodies they don't have the side wings uh, they don't have that downforce in the body, except for the cap forwards. So they have to do something for the rear wing to have the balance right. But that's where they drill the holes. Um, so if you have a, want to have more downforce, you need to add to the front um, to have the balance right. If you okay with less downforce, you can remove from the rear to add the balance right. And that's why the people are drilling, drilling the wings because the average body that is most people are driving, J Concept S15 or something similar, the balance of that body is too far rearwards if you consider the whole car to have the wing be as big as it is. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's as simple as that. Um, you can even try it put on a cap backwards body and you can see that you probably would have to drill even bigger holes to make it balance okay. right. Okay. Uh, Powell at uh, Race Stars Poland, he goes, on, what address in Spain do I need to, for you, Keenan, to send you a Race Stars car bag? Um, I'll get you, I'll, you know, you'll talk about that. Let's get that worked out. Those are very cool bags. All right. Uh, Sean Rusi says, we need to talk to engines and brands, I don't know about y'all, but I think y'all's podcast needs to have engine builders and talk about their engines. He says the Drake Racing engine is so reliable, it's more reliable than um, electric cars. I'm sure I'm on my 15th, 14th engine in two years. So I had to clarify this. I had to clarify this. I was like, so come on, you use 14 engines in two years, or you just have 14. He clarified he's not used 14 engines, he has four yeah. that's still a lot of engines, but um. I'll tell you somebody that I would like to have on her. <clears throat> Marco Rossi. I like to I like to know the thoughts behind Reds. So when you talk about engine builders, they are engine builders. <clears throat> I've had Adrian Bartin on her. Excuse me. I've had Adrian on her. He's an engine builder. I guess that guy, Ed Bridges, too, from EB Mods. He knows a lot about that type of stuff. Um, I don't know if Drake's an engine builder. Per se, but I mean, he knows shit when it comes to this type of stuff. 
uh, I think engine guys are special. Even any 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 full scale stuff that they do. I was hanging out with my buddy Tony Patashaw at Dirty Assets Engine Services. Uh, at Wicked Weekend and RC Prime and he's showing me the uh, pinch machine that he bought. Like, and he was telling me how much it costs. He's showing me how it does it. It isn't like a normal one. And he's just doing it right there in his trailer while he's talking to me. And the way he treats engines and all that stuff is really cool. But yeah, I definitely would like to get some engine builders. I think Marco Rossi, I would love to have Mario Rossi, but he speaks, he doesn't speak English, so that's to go through Marco to find out what's going on with that. Uh, let's see, we have a couple more questions. Uh, Steve Battaglia, why did JQ switch from talking about RC to now it's all his mental issues? That's JQ. I answered to it actually. That's just, just JQ. That's his new, that's his new thing, right? Yeah. He's trying to fix it. He, he talks about RC, but now you have to pay for it. You know, that's the, yeah. that's the thing. Uh, Buggy Brent, my last burner was about 10 years ago, RC burner. Was about was a, was watching an eight scale nitro cross truck ripping around Thunder Alley in California. I think you meant Revelation. That was uh, Ryan Mayfield, the SC8. Please help me get another burner. I, I'm trying not to help you do that, uh, Buggy Brent. Uh, because another class, yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, I got reload. You can rub one out on your friend, and he won't go flying off the track. Rubbing is racing. Another way to run nitro. When your 40 plus grandpa isn't available to pitch you, it's a great way to grow nitro and get burners again. What are your thoughts, Lefty? I mean, every time we talk about a, a nice class, this comes up. Um, I don't know if it's ever going to catch one, just not enough. I know a lot of people have converted their cars over to that. The what class? I just heard uh, uh, nitro, nitro short course truck. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, a few times before. I like I it. Like, I I'd, like, I'd, I'd like it. I'd like it. But I'd run, I'd honestly run electric. Uh, Chase Marquette of Chasing Trophies. Why am I so slow? Because you're out there getting a whole bunch of content. Content is king. Then it comes your, then it comes your racing. Chasing Trophies. Check them out. Nathan Marsh. When will Kyosha create, create a new 10 scale competition offer a buggy platform? Surely it's time. Surely it's time not to. Because that's exactly yeah. what they're going to do. Not build another one. They were barely successful with the last one. The last iteration of this, and I don't I think mean, they're they, going to they, revisit it. They, they won world championships. They were barely so successful. They had team. They won world championships. They had team. That was 2013. It's yeah, that's, yeah. That was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were successful in, in 10 scale, but um, the thing is that 10 scale market doesn't make any sense. You know anymore? It's too well, many, too many cars. ten scale port, ten scale touring car, and, and ten scale, uh, ten scale offer at our biggest markets. Which for X ray, it, it should be because you know that's they're they're in two small markets. But yeah, but I mean, it's, it's different yeah. for X ray because like they already have good distributor network, so it's like most people pick between X ray or associated. Um, in 10 scale in 8 scale it's much more broad but also 8 scale makes you more money and the cars are more expensive parts are more expensive um, I don't see Kyosha making, uh, I think that I don't. I just don't see Kyosha, that. I think their 8 scale program just got turned around on racing I do not see 10 scale coming anytime soon but we could they are, they are making they are making a touring car at least I, anything's possible, Max. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, okay. I don't, Here's the I don't, Here's your cars I, out. I don't think they're making 10 scale off road cars ever again, at least for the foreseeable future. They might come out with a touring car because there was this one guy who was running a Kyosho prototype car. I don't think they ever came out with it, but they have. They were running a Kyosho prototype. Um, I think they were just going to focus on eight scale. Touring cars is different because there's 90% of the parts are machined. So you can basically sell 100, produce 100, never produce any again. But for 10 scale off-road, you have to make an initial investment of most likely close to or over 100,000, hundreds of thousands. And then you have to sell to make that money back. And you have to be committed to that for quite a while. But for touring, you can pretty much make a car, uh, sell a hundred, and like make your own back. You know, pretty much. You know what, Max? 
We have another fucking science mode question. Jesus Christ on a motorbike. Is it Alex? Do, uh, yes, Alex wrote a dissertation for us. Well, th I can be a bit quicker with that because I, I think right. I, I read that. I know. Uh, didn't we talk about axles and all this stuff here? Max Moore, can we talk about the relationship between axle height and roll center? <clears throat> I.e., if you raise axle height on most cars, it means lowering the lower hinge at the hub, which raises roll center generally the opposite of the direction RC should go when raising axle height, assuming high grip. In these cases, it's beneficial to have a hub like a Miyako three piece axle three piece since axle height is independently adjusted from R from RC roll center through bearing inserts on cars that can change axle height by moving the hinge pin relative to the hub. Do you lower your RC, your roll center in all other ways to keep the same roll center when raising the axle? Whew. Okay. So for like axle height for dummies now, if you have a regular car, a scale car, where there's no axle independent axle height adjustment, but there's the hinge pin height adjustment on the hub. Every time you raise the hub, you also raise the upper link. This means like in general, if you'd raise the upper link, same setup change would happen. Okay. So um, why would you want this? You don't want this. So in general, if you raise your hub one millimeter, you should lower the link one millimeter. If you raise the hub five millimeters, you should lower the link five millimeters. For example, in the JQ back in the day, we always, when we raised the hub, we lowered the link one hole. Uh, with the Mayako, um, I haven't really played with the hub height that much. I kind of run it all the always where it is. So I keep the link where it is. But if I would raise the hub considerably, I would uh, lower the link unless I wanted some additional effects. So um, every time you raise the hub, yes, you raise the axle, but you also raise the link, which adjusts your roll center. Uh, so if you want to have a car that roll center stays similar, it doesn't ever stay the same, by the way, but stay similar. Uh, you raise the hub and you load the link the same exact amount. Okay. Now to the science mode stuff, I'm going to look at the clock and I'm going to keep it at one and a half minutes. Okay. So when you raise the axle, even independent of everything, you actually do change your row center. And the change is much more, much less, uh, uh, like, um, it's, it's not as high of a change of row center, but it's still a significant change. Because you're moving at the arm angles relative to the tire, where the tire is always on the ground, obviously, and you're going to keep your right height the same. So this means that every time you move anything in, in the car that's attached to the linkage of the chassis of the car, you're moving your roll set. That's just how it is. Um, and on top of this, when you look at the axle height or the hub height, the much more domin dominant change is in the height or the hinge pin height relative to the axle, because that's where you get your force. The maximum amount of force on the car is on the tire, and that that force is then transferred onto the linkages through the lower arm mostly. So that hinge pin height is very dominant. And that's why looking at specifically from roll center is usually, in my opinion, not the thing you should look at. Obviously, you should try to diminish its effect, but you should, it's not the main thing in that. And that's why it's not always about roll center. It's more so about it's a system of hinges. Okay, I went a bit over one and a half minutes, but it was really good. All right. Very good. Patrick, thank you, Alex, for the question. Patrick Zamora, I will, I will raise using 16% fuel for the first time. What are, you, what are your suggestions to tune properly? Lean it out. Yeah, so basically what you need to do um, is if you previously ran any additional shims below the head of the engine, if you ran a cold plug, let's say a P4, uh, you should go down to something like a P3 and reduce the shims. This is 
not because oh it burns colder it burns hotter no it's not because of that it's to get more reliability for your idle the shimming doesn't do that the plug i mean so if you did i for example was one of those guys who always run a p4 um with 25 percent fuel because that way i could run the engine leaner without it starting to idle too high but for the 16 percent, well actually 12 percent fuel with that fuel, the EU legalized fuel, um, the issue is with a cold plug that you your idle security is not good enough. So you want to go to a hotter plug, even though in theory it probably doesn't burn. Like it, you should go the opposite. But for the idle, you do this, um, and then you can tune it better. Um, also, like if you add a shimming, remove it. You want it. As low as possible, but don't. I, I personally haven't gone below the standard amount of shimming. Um, then one good thing is if you want to maintain like a, a similar power band to twenty five percent, you have to like introduce more air into the engine. Uh, so a really good way to do this is to get one of the air filters. I personally use the ultimate. Um, I think it's called Air Max. Mm -hmm. uh, air filter. filter yeah so that that specific filter is is amazing i i got it early on this year and i've been using it since i highly suggest everyone to get that um and uh there are there are also other brands who sell these bigger type of filters but i think the ultimate uh filter is one that kind of fits all cars it's sort of universal in that sense mm -hmm. and uh, i think the design is kind of optimized for that so I highly suggest anyone who runs with 12% fuel to get that yeah. filter. Um, okay, so you got those things in line. Can then I just what go? you do, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Finish your yeah. So, so when you got those things uh, in control, then you you tune the engine. So in general, the top end is not your issue. The end is more so the bottom end. So the bottom end, in general, from what I've like uh, what I've had to do personally, so this is purely, purely on my experience. Lean leaning out the bottom by ten to fifteen minutes, uh, and then leaning out the top, maybe around five minutes. But I usually what I do is I just lean out the bottom ten to fifteen minutes from the get go. I drive it on the track. We'll see how it is, and usually then I lean the top, or then you can leave lean the top five minutes, lean the bottom fifteen. In general, if your engine wasn't good tuned with twenty percent, twenty five percent fuel, you should be good to go. Just like doing these changes, um, and I think, yeah, that's that's what I do. That's how I because I have I've had to switch between fuels because uh, like in Europe, a lot of races still run twenty five. In Finland, everyone runs twelve. Uh, and then I, at the beginning, there was a sort of vice versa. So yeah. switching between yeah. these, it's kind of easy when you do these steps. So highly suggest someone trying, and if it doesn't work or if it works, giving feedback. Because for me, at least, this process has been quite simple, and I haven't seen any issue with moving to 12%. And I would believe in the future we should all move to that, not maintain with 25 That's my opinion. Next question, last question of our Facebook questions. Don Tranquil, if RC were to become an Olympic sport, which class of format would need to be raced? E Truggy, two, two 10 minutes to race. <laughs> Why E Truggy? Because it's the fastest and they handle the best in the air. And um, it, as much as I want to say nitro, it's got to be short. No fumes can't be inside. It's going to be inside. So. E Truggy, super fast. Whipping that stuff all over the place, making big passes, all that good stuff. Or I think it okay. for short course truck. I think we should do e buggy, and then ten scale touring car, because they always have a few different ones. Those two, mm, that could work. That could work. I could live with that. All right, going on to a few YouTube questions, and that's going to be it. We have one question from Darren Steiner. He wants to know. Do you think the new Hong Nor X3 cars will ever be as competitive as the Jammer was back in the day? No. The Jammer came out at a different time. And I, if I'm not mistaken, this Hong Nor is still using some of the technology from that car, um, which was 20 years ago. 
different times. Jamming came out. They did a lot of cool, awesome things. Now we have 35,000 different brands of chassis in the eight scale market. I don't see nothing. I don't see it even being a tenth as popular as Jammin was because I've seen people try to reiterate this car. The IGT8. Hong North's going to stay where it's good. GT. That's where it's good. People like the IGT8. People like the uh, regular GT. I, I just don't see it happening in off road. Sorry. I just, just my thoughts. <clears throat> you agree with that, Max? Or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Uh, EKJ24000, what's up, Corey? Why don't pros put on races? For example, an Adam Drake Invitational or JQ RC Supercross. Well, JQ did something called RCGP. It was a series of races, so he did that. But I think these racers get paid to go to races, not put on races, and they probably see how much. So, <clears throat> so people think you just put on a race, and there's money. No, there's the think... time and effort and building up of that race to make money as well. No, but right. I think what he means is uh, kind of like drivers would be promoting races with their own brand. You know, like, for example, every one of I mean, these Drake pro drivers have a home. Drake did the gas truck nationals. No, no, but I mean, every one yard. of these pro drivers have a home track, right? All right. So, so hold on. You know why these guys are doing it? Because it's too much fucking races out there as it is. Where are they going to put it? So hold on, yeah, in between I know, I know. in between Dakota Fenn racing three times a weekend, three times a month, he's gonna put on a race too. Nah, it's not gonna happen. It's just too much work. It's I, too I much know. work. Okay, I was just and saying like Edward is completely flooded. I think he's talking about them guys putting on a race because I think what it is they they're gonna put on a race how they want it to be held. Well, JQ did it. it was RCGP? I don't. And you ask him how much work it was. For nothing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of interpret the question more so in a way of, you know, because like Valentino Rossi, he has his own like events that he kind of invites people to. And yeah, but then they're, they not race. they're like, come to my fucking compound and let's hang out for the day. And no, we'll but there's something. always a there's always a race, but it's like less serious. It's, it's more so about. Yeah, but Valentino Rossi's fucking a good bazillion bazillionaire. <laughs> okay, That's know, also but... a big thing. He's fucking I know, rich. But, but still, the point, point He's being not fucking, that... You, oh, yeah, Mayfield's going to put on a race with his $150,000 a year. You know, come no. on. <laughs> fuck. The Compared point, to fucking the Valentino Rocky's fucking $100 million empire that he's got. Like some okay. tax write-off. Because it costs money to put on fucking races, and it takes, on it takes time before I you get that back. I think what he means is like... No, I know driver, what he means. Kyosho Masters, why you know what he means? You talk because I know him. Corey, I didn't know that's what he's getting at. Why don't they put the, I could be wrong, but he's asking why don't drivers put on races because obviously they always, they know how they want a race to be held. Hey, no, we you, don't, you, don't, this. you don't get your the bottom line to... is, The bottom line is there's no fucking available dates. The second line is there's the amount of money that needs to be put into this to make it happen, to be good. And they got paid to race, not put on races. So as long as they got paid to race, they're fine. I, I maybe, believe in 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 like a system where lawyers don't give you receive like um, lawyers don't give you medical advice and doctors don't give you legal advice. You know, that's kind so of like a race doesn't mean you're going to be a good race promoter. Yeah. So yeah. maybe in one that day, sense, yeah, I agree with you. But I think anyway. it could be nice to have these like uh, friendly events. Of these pros, because like some of these pros have a big name and they have a home track, and people know them at their home track. Maybe some other people could come for further away. So I think like things like that. Sure. I, I think right. it. Well, we're gonna wrap this up here shortly. Right here, we got one more question. Uh, world's top five predictions. Right now. Okay, that's that's actually good because uh, my hot potato subject was the top twenty-five. So let me bring that up. Let's look at the top twenty-five and make our picks. Let's segue into a hot race, hot tire, hot potato, top 25 rankings. Do you have it up there, Max? Yeah. I'm going to go off pure feelings and no facts. Go ahead. Okay. So my, um, the way, okay, I want to first kind of look at this. I don't believe Kanas and Ongaro are third and fourth in the world. I do believe that they are both ahead of the Americans. 
Um, of course you do. But mean. no, it, it's not that. Okay. But I do believe. Okay. No, it's not that. Okay. Okay. Keenan. Canas came to America and won. Okay. Elliot Boots came to America and won. Cannot argue with that. Cannot argue okay? with that. Cannot argue yeah. with that. That's Cannot why. Argue. That's why I think. The you Europeans. know what I don't have Ongaro as beating the Americans all the time. In Europe, yes. In America, no. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but I think Canas is more competitive in American soil these days. Either way, okay. This if you look at the top four, I cannot argue that give me your top one, five finishers at one, the world. One of these four is gonna be the winner. Uh, in about a month's time, actually, quite exactly a month's time. Okay, mm. so I'm gonna give you give you my top four. I do believe Canas is going to win his world first world. Okay, and I do believe Davide Ongaro will still finish second. Okay, okay. and I do believe also that there will be an American on the podium. And that the American... Samuel Mayfield. And that, that, that's where I'm coming to. That's, that's a difficult one, because all logic and reasoning says Fend, but my feelings say that Fend can't make it and Mayfield could. Okay. So it, it, it's once again one of those. Um, if I say Fend... We all know that Fen's gonna like do something stupid and he's not gonna make it. But if I say Mayfield, then I look like oh, like you just pick the easy one and like he has a he, like maybe he's not good. Like, well, you pick your fucking work, top whatever. five. <laughs> okay, for fuck's sake, I'll pick. Okay, I'm gonna go with Ryan Mayfield in third. He's gonna miss his worlds once again with Dakota Fend in fifth. Because my fourth guy is my European European friend, Burak Kilic. Okay. I wonder if you can put a Kilic rather than there. Okay. Yeah. Good. So no Rana Falk in your top five. I don't believe he could make it because even at the Euros, he was barely in the top five if everyone finished. So yes. Speaking of Rana Falk, just looking at the comment. David Rana Falk uses FX engine. Six okay. exclamation marks by somebody. Um, all right, my top five. I do agree that Kanas will win this. He is my favorite right now going into this. <laughs> wow. You, it's, you know very, it's very identical because I have Ongaro in second. I have Ryan Mayfield or Fend in third. I have Rana Falk in fourth. And I have Coelho in my top five. That's oh, weird. Fuck, I about Coelho, and, like, it's, I think... it, it's hard to make any predictions. It's It's... So fuck it. It's it's so many fast guys going into this. Fuck, it's hard. I'm missing people too. So Jesus, Lord have mercy. Yeah, I have to. I have to say can, be, can I have top fives yeah. in different universes, like the multiverse? Yeah, of course, of course. So I can have multiple different top fives. I have I have top fives in my universe where it's Fan Mayfield Ongaro and Ongaro Mayfield this and Rana Falk. It's it's you know what. It's it's hard to predict. All I can say is I would a very good race. That's what I want. I have, and I would okay. love to see. Just, just, I gave you my top five: Kanas, Ongaro, okay, okay, okay. and Ronafalk Mayfield. Yeah, yeah. But I have to say this one thing because I've been thinking about this for a while now. As much as it makes sense to pick Canas based on current form, um, historical data, and uh, any other thing, okay? My feelings still tell me that he doesn't have it in him as much as Ongaro has it Fuck. in him. Jeez, what, what more is it going to take from you to believe in fucking JC3? It's going to... It's what it takes from JC3... Is a result where he Dominate. absolutely, absolutely he dominates. Nobody didn't because did it twice this year. Where 
He dominated the Euros. Nobody could catch him at the Euros. He dominated. They catch him at the end. They caught him at the end. Because that's, he that's, slowed that's, the fuck down. Well, he's he tires no were tires. Done. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. His tires were done at the end of the race like they're supposed to do. And he slowed down. Okay. He still fucking won. <laughs> okay. He he finished what? Four Excellent. seconds, six seconds ahead of the second place, man. That's not a dominating win. Sure, he ran away with it. Okay. Did he ever not? Was was he ever not in first the entire race? No. Okay. But he he he, he wasn't the fa- okay, Keenan. He was not the fastest guy out on the track from the start to finish. Okay. Well, he when was you're the running fastest guy. Booms, <laughs> that might happen at the end. <laughs> yeah, but how how do we yeah, know yeah, that no, that's no, not gonna happen? There's no the fuck. He's so awesome that he had no tires left. He's practically running on foams. That he still fucking won this race. No, he didn't dominate the race. Fuck Max. What is somebody gonna have to do to garner your favor? Are they gonna have to like reinvent the wheel? Are they gonna have to like sail around the world and prove to you that it's not flat? Are they gonna have to fucking chain themselves to multiple fucking? Sequoia trees that have been around for 2,000 years so they don't fucking no no threat of ever getting fucking cut down. Are they going to have to join the Sea Shepherd and go out there and save whales? What do they have to do? They have to to be that man's a European champion two times in a row. He won Silver State this year. They have to beat Ongaro. He beat Ongaro. When Ongaro doesn't retire or Drive like an idiot or whatever. When Ongaro is in form, they have to beat Ongaro. And there has so far been not many drivers who have actually done it in Europe. And this guy's one of them. Well, he did it once in Italy. That's the only time. <laughs> At a All track right. where no, Ongaro Max, has never won. You know, Max, okay. No, you're just no, you're just you're just throwing shade to throw shade. You're not even talking facts now. You're I am talking, talking facts feelings right now. No, but let's talk about has beat Ongaro quite a few times over the last two years. Okay, let's go through them. Let's go. Oh through Jesus! Them. Do you have them up yet? Because I, we're we're only an hour ahead of all of over what we're supposed to go through, and I want to finish this up because I have a I have actually some breaking news that just came in while I was doing this. Okay, but serious breaking news. Okay, hot take on the hot race. My 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 point my point here is. That when Ongaro is prepared for a specific event and in a specific way to actually win that event, there really, really rarely is anyone who can absolutely beat him on merit. I would agree with you. When when he's on form. And if we look at in the past, yes, Kanas dominated the Euros last year. But Ongaro was clearly struggling with the tires. He was clearly at a major disadvantage. Okay. Euros this year, he had a flame out. Okay. So we never got to see the end result. Okay. In 2022, Euros, um, Ronefolk won. Yes. But Ongaro again, he had an issue. So the thing is, like, yes, these other people beat Ongaro, they win over Ongaro. And that is possible. So but the reason why Ongaro won the Worlds twice in a row is because when it actually matters, he's always there at his very best. Okay? And when he's there at his very best, I have not seen many actually, or I don't, I, I, I'd say I'd even go this far. I haven't seen anyone actually beat him just straight up when he's at his best. Okay. You know, I've seen him being a thorn in his side. Juan Carlos Canas. And I think he's going to yeah. be a thorn in everybody's side here. Very he, it's, This is one of those mental things. So if Canas, he has to mentally beat Ongaro. And I have not seen anyone mentally beat Ongaro, at least I did. to my memory. I did. I saw Canas. I saw Canas. Oh, in Italy. Yeah. Angara's brain, some sort of strong at Gusago. Okay, it's going to be yeah, impressive. That's, that's the matters. one. That's the one example of that happening. And I'm seeing that him being said, Ongaro always sucks at that track. That's like the track's like his no, nemesis. He does, he does suck. He does suck yeah. at that track. Yeah. 
All right, Max. All right. So we're, we're not too far off on our top fives. We're not too far off. Yeah, pretty yes. similar. All right, Max. So I have a hot race, hot take. I'm actually just posting this up on our socials. But uh, Thomas Tram has stepped on from his uh, positions at Horizon. Okay, so what's going to happen to Horizon? So, so there's what he says. Thomas Tram, if you know who he is, he is the team manager for TLR, I think for ProLine, and for Trinity. So Thomas says, after 4.5, wow, oh, he's been there for 4.5 years. After 4.5 years in this position as a team manager for Hobby Horizon Hobby, we did some unexpected, unforgivable, unforgettable things, like winning uh, IFMAR World Championships, 20 plus World National titles. And most importantly, I met some amazing people and found some awesome friends along the way. With that said, I've decided to step down from my role as team manager at Horizon Hobby. It's time to chase another dream as I relocate and start my own family. I can't thank Horizon enough for their keeping me in the HH family by allowing me to stay on board in a different role that's part-time and look forward to helping and serving the RC community in a lighter capacity. Uh, so, yeah, he just goes on to say thank you to everybody and to all his team guys and all that stuff, and thank you for all his support. So, yeah, Thomas Tran has stepped on from his team manager – TV manager roles at Horizon. And you know what? I am not surprised because fuck me, that must be a stressful job. And I would not want to be the man doing that. Yeah. Okay, so, but it seems like he's not leaving Horizon. He's just like leaving. I don't role. understand what the hell doing. Something. He's going to start his own. He's moving. He's relocating. He might be. He's from the Pacific Northwest originally. So he might be going back up there. What I think is he has something he wants to do, like make mm -hmm. his own company, doing something outside of RC, or maybe within RC, who, who the fuck knows. Um, and during that time, he's going to put up this whole thing. He's going to work at Horizon part-time doing some things. That's how mm -hmm. I understood. So uh, it's not like he's leaving Horizon. He's just like, hey, I cannot do this full-time anymore. I want to do something else. So that's pretty much it. So no, not that not, not any drama really. Just I know drama, but do. not 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 unexpected. I just I just came up on his socials. Uh, I think I think he did a I think he did a good job at TLR, and I think he did a good job oh, at yeah. TLR. I think he did a good job at TLR when he was given very little to work with. You yeah. know, his budget getting cut, keep getting cut and cut. You know, and um. He still managed to win a world championship. He still managed to win win national championships with them in Dakota. Still got one of the fastest, if not the fastest, race in the world on the Dakota fan running TLR. But well, man, I bet you this man's life was stressed. He had all, you know, you, man, like, and you know, like, you always gotta, you gotta, you. When you're working in a company, I can only imagine. I don't know if this is true, but when you're working in a company like Horizon which is making a whole bunch of money off all this bashing stuff and boats and planes and all this stuff. You constantly have to justify why your little small little RC team needs yeah. all this money. And where is the money coming from? Where, what money are you making to replenish this? And I know that com as, as corporate penny pushers, pencil pushers, penny pinchers, that's what corporate uh, horizon is thinking about. And but the passionate RC guys like fuck it, we're gonna just spend whatever we can to race. So I think I think that uh, Thomas Tran did an amazing job at TLR anytime he was there, and probably fuck fucking stressed the fuck out with all the fucking different hats he was wearing. So thank you. I think Thomas Tran has been a breath of fresh air in RC. He did a very good job at J Concept. He's one of the guys who started doing all these vlogs and going around and just doing all this type of stuff. Because that's how he started. I remember seeing Tram with his camera and a stand and a microphone on the front, walking around doing the J Concepts vlogs and stuff like that and getting videos. So maybe he's like, I'm going to do something not an RC that makes real money, equal stress, uh, real money, better money. Yeah, I dibble and dabble in RC. So thank you, Thomas Tran, for all that you did for TLR. You're going to be missed there because it's going to be hard to fill those shoes. And make work what you made work. Max, I think that's it. We did go an hour over, but yeah. it's a lot. It's, it's only hours. an hour, dude. Well, we only went an hour over. You know, that's pretty good for us. Pretty good. It was a good chat. Good catch up with you, Max. Thank you, everybody, for all the questions. We greatly appreciate all your questions. We were able to get most of them in this time around. Uh, 
congratulations once again to Dakota Fan and all the winners from Wicked Weekend. Uh, we have the Worlds coming up next week. I think Max and I are taking a little break. We will have a podcast, hopefully, with just a guest. Then I think we'll do a the week after that, and near the end of the month, we'll start unveiling what we're going to be doing for the Worlds. We're working hard with that, getting all our graphics done. Thank you to all the companies that came on to support us for the Worlds. Uh, we'll, I'll, we'll talk about that as we get further. We are going to do a pre-World show before we leave. Coming up, Max, I am going to chill out for the next few weeks here in uh, Dominican Republic. I got RC You're Boat Project. Go on huh? You're going to go on holiday? Somewhat a holiday, a staycation. Like, basically, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a, probably a week or 10 days, 15 days off. No RC stuff. Nothing. Like, no, you know, we'll obviously be doing stuff. And so, now saying that, what's something crazy happened? Like, silly season. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm retired from silly season. That's up to you. <laughs> silly season sleuths to figure that all out. Don't come to the silly season master and ask for my input and stuff because I'm retired and nothing you can do can make me come out of retirement for silly season. Nothing at all. Damn you, silly season. Max, you have a good weekend. Tell your girlfriend we only been an hour ahead. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you all to all the NNRC <clears throat> squad around the world we can't do this without you guys thank you for hitting that sub like notification button and uh, continue to follow us over 293 episodes we greatly appreciate it uh, a big thank you to our patrons and youtube members if you wish to support the podcast and get early access of podcasts uh join our patron and youtube member programs we have links for that in the written description we have links for all our sponsors company sponsors of the podcast and remember showing the sponsors some love shows the podcast love we have affiliate links where you can save money, where we can make money. We have coupon codes where you can save money. We just have links where you just go order and let them know that you heard about them from no, the No Name RC Podcast. They are Invisible Speed, High Tech RC, Course of Tech USA, Sidewinder Fuel, Myako, Beach RC, Techno RC, Clinic RC, Stacked RC, uh, Racecraft USA, Call RC, Elite RC Productions, and Donathan RC. Uh, a big shout out to our drivers, Dave Ronfalk, Robert Batty, Alexander Hagberg, Maddie G, Peko Evenen, Mason Fuller, you know, Hutton. Oh, by the way, that track that uh, uh, JQ, Peko, and Robert went to in Estonia this past weekend. Whew, beautiful. I know JQ complains about the smooth tracks and all that stuff, but when Robert said, hey, it rained for 12 hours and in 30 minutes we was running. Beautiful facility. Beautiful facility. That's your I love to. Is Estonia cheap? Um. Yeah. Well, the workforce like, is cheap, but... It's getting it's getting better. It's improving right. a lot. Like a nice place to visit where you don't spend a lot of money. I like I like to go there. Uh but yeah, that was a beautiful yeah. track. Hey, you know what? I Max? mean it's I mean, not it's not cheap like the Dominican, but it's like cheaper than I think Portugal's cheaper than the Dominican Republic. Get really? That. Yes. No. Well, yes. Some things maybe, but no. Some right. food and stuff. Food really uh, I, yes. Believe it or not. I I couldn't believe it. How much? Uh, how much is like an average salary in the Dominican Republic? Much less than what you make in Portugal. So it's just that you, like your shit is like, really expensive. All that stuff in Portugal is cheap. I I would live in Portugal. That's how cheap it is to me. Rent would be a little expensive, but yeah, maybe it's that then. Yeah, maybe it's just like you guys have less rent and so on. Yeah, yeah Estonia is like probably. Well, probably around the same as Portugal then. Good stuff. Good stuff. It was good catching up with you. Have a good day. Yeah. Have a good weekend. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your notes. See you soon in Spain. Me, you, Salty Joe. All sure in a hotel room. I feel sorry for you guys. With that said, Nitro's the glory. E-Buggy pays the bills. If you ain't grinding, you're sliding. Max and Lefty out. You guys have a good weekend. Be safe. Safe travels. Adios, muchachos.